<laughs> Scotty, what did you eat? Damn it, Scotty. Oh, Stop. Oh. Damn it. Ew. Ah. Oh, God, you son of a bitch. Oh, damn. Ugh. The fuck did you eat, man? Uh, I had like ten bean burritos for lunch, dude. I'm sorry. God, you disgust me. Oh damn, dude. Oh man, what an unprofessional way to start the show. I know. Am I farting? Oh, like farting, for, man. Forever. What a How low did my brow- fucking gut feel, you know, dude. I tried to make this a more highbrow show. You know, I was like, Ugh. we were on <laughs> such a lowbrow show before, and I just wanted to be on a highbrow intellectual show. Yeah, me too, man. And then b- fucking a year later. <laughs> Farting. Just farting and belching and Fart, belch crap and, and all pants. this nonsense. I mean, what, what the fuck do you guys want me to I do? I guess I'm just a lowbrow son of a bitch. Yeah, yeah. I do. Oh, it's not you doing it, man. It's me. I mean, you I can't... just know. I just attract lowbrow, low class motherfuckers. I, mean, like I you, guess. Scotty. I guess you do, man. Big old bean burrito eating farting motherfuckers, man. That's what Let we're looking for. Let me ask you a for. question, TJ. If you could have farted like that, you wouldn't have done it. It, I bet it felt great. No, it dude, would be a relief. It's one of the most sure. satisfying feelings I've ever had in my life. To be perfectly yeah, dude. honest. To, to equalize pressure, you know? Yeah, what I mean? yeah. I mean, burping is fun, but when you let a fucking long fart rip... Like and everyone a has big to, fart. And everyone has I'm to not fond of, uh, of burping. You don't like burping? I mean, it's all right, but, you know... I like burping. Every time I burp, I just kind of, like, view it as a missed opportunity for a fart. Like, that's uh, not went, the way it works. You went the wrong way, gas. No. Yeah. It's, that's not the way it works. It dude. is the way it it's works. different gases. It's not. The gas that comes out of your asshole is not the same gas. The gas out of your ass. It's the stomach. same gas, Paul. No, it isn't. It's the same gas. TJ, you just are, went the wrong way. It just took a wrong turn at Albuquerque. You dog. are ignorant of biology, and that is not even the, the point of my Tajivans today. Gas. It's Rock. time for a Tajivans. Oh, it's time for the Tajivans. Well, I'm going to go grab my snack. I'll see you later. Tajivans. You ain't getting yourself a no, fucking I'm gonna snack. I'm going to grab myself a little Set snack while you, uh, while you. Air your There's a snack in the closet, buddy. You're piddling. What do you want? You ain't, getting that, you ain't getting no snack. Put them headphones back on. Sit down. Go grab a quick snack. No, sit down. Grab a quick. What? Sit down. You ain't you getting no snack. Here. This is false yeah. imprisonment. I'm calling the police. Call them. Yeah, call them. Call all, right. all right, all right, all right. Call them. Put your headphones back on. You will hear I'm the gonna have to say, I don't have to listen to yes, your you Yes, you do. You know, maybe the audience has to suffer through your lies and slander. No, I don't have to You fuck Paul over, dude. Give Paul the floor, TJ. Give him the floor, dude. Yeah, you can have the floor. His fat ass can fill. Oh, on it. I had the floor today, TJ. I had the floor. Take your fucking floor, bitch. I don't give a shit. So, TJ, the great Shaggy. Hey, fuck you. Oh, I'm sorry. My hand, my finger slipped. <laughs> Turn my fucking mic back on, you piece of shit. <laughs> All can't, right. Dude, I can't wait until our undisclosed audio guy takes that away, that power away from you, TJ. The power of the mute button. What a great day mm-hmm. that will be. What yeah. a tyrant you are, TJ. Uh huh. Anyway, long story short. Fuck you! Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought I was turning it back on. I'm gonna turn back on. I'm gonna kill you, TJ. (laughs) I'm gonna murder you. What little energy I have left is being spent on this nonsense, TJ. Uh huh. Could you could you do me a favor, Scotty? Could you cave his fucking skull in, please, on camera? Shit, dude. Could you grab something heavy and just beat him over the head with it until he dies? I don't have anything heavy. I would, dude. Is there anything around here that would beat that big, thick Damn. Neanderthal skull in? I don't even no. care about the Tajivans anymore, TJ. No, I oh, just yeah? want to make death threats at you for the next five minutes. I want to hire a hitman to kill you, TJ. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like a weird fucking specialist hitman that's not well, just going to shoot you and leave you in a ditch. In fact, how long did you spend outside? A 90 fucking minutes 90 in the min- sweltering Louisiana sun because I because TJ's ass doesn't wake up before noon and doesn't read his phone. Dude, he was asleep in a dark, cool room, too. I left him a nice text message last night saying, TJ, hey, could you leave me a key or like leave your unlock your back door or something so I can get mm-hmm. in tomorrow so I'm not dying outside because I got to come by early. All I, right. I sat out there for 90 minutes, TJ. Let I made a ideology you. that people are roundly you. criticizing, TJ, because of my low energy, because of he, uh, a near heat <laughs> totally stroke, valid. TJ. It's a totally valid point, Paul. Near heat stroke. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. What do you have to say to yourself, TJ? Look at all of the money that I have saved you, Paul. The money I've saved you? The money I saved you. What did you do? Switch me to Geico? No, no, no. Look at that. Damn. Sauna installation cost, I mean, Paul. that is a good point, dude. A- National average for a sauna, 
Four thousand five hundred dollars. Let me tell you something. How much was your sauna this morning, Paul? If ever there was, was a stupid person, morning? it would be somebody that has a sauna in Louisiana. What an <laughs> unfucking believably stupid person. <laughs> yeah, you might as well just spend that money moving here. It's called sitting outside. <laughs> oh, oops. Probably not time for that. Oops. Yet. Oh, good times. Good times, Paul. You're a piece of shit, TJ. Well, you know what? You guys are always saying, you know, we come at one thirty, we come at one thirty, and then you come fucking an hour and a half before. Dude, I get so. here early every Monday. You uh-huh. know this. I never. I don't this has that. been. Uh-oh. I ain't never heard of that. Wait a minute, Paul. You hear that? Uh oh, is that the faggot alarm? I hear. <laughs> I think I hear the faggot alarm going off. Now Wait. you've gotten our our YouTube video banned. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> faggot alert. <laughs> Well, why is it going off near you? Oh, I don't know. I think it's <laughs> reacting to you, actually. But, yeah. Oh, it was reacting to me while you spoke? Yeah. Oh, that's not how faggot alarms work, TJ. <laughs> I mean, you would know. You're the expert. All right, flock of seagulls. You don't want to go down yeah, this why, road. Why are you hiding you know, that, I don't want to go down this road. What, what am I hiding? I'm not hiding shit. I don't see your little flock of seagulls thing, dude. What do, you, what do you mean you don't see it? I don't it. see it. Where it's is on it? my fucking head. Where's uh, I'm not seeing on that side. Wrong side. Oh, there, there it is. Oh, there. why are you wearing a hat recently, TJ? You look like you're ashamed of it. Do you feel ashamed? I wear a hat all the time. Do you feel ashamed, TJ? Paul's wearing a hat right TJ, now. T- now, TJ, I want to ask you something. Do you feel ashamed of yourself, <coughs> baby? Did you, you feel to. ashamed? Did you cut your hair like that? No, actually, I want to do more. Oh, you want to? Chelsea? Oh, why don't you do more, <coughs> TJ? Why, TJ, why don't you just shave your little head right there, TJ? Go ahead and shave it. I was on the. <coughs> Why don't you go ahead and do page boy? <coughs> oh, hold on, I'm gonna die. Why do? You, why is your page instinct to get closer to the mic when you fucking die coughing? <coughs> <coughs> um, pardon me. Ugh. Why don't you just cough a little bit more, dude? Why don't you just cough into the fucking mic the whole episode? Is that just what talking? the fuck is cough. wrong with you? This motherfucker's got emphysema, dude. Lots of things. I don't know. Dude, you got fucking emphysema, fucking TJ. Living. What the fuck is wrong with you, man? Oh, my God. Oh. Why do you cough so much? I don't Not know. Like, 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 dude, I'm sensitive to coughing, he's too. Got, but, he's got COPD, But, damn, dude, dude, you fucking, like, cough more than anybody. I fucking he's got mesothelioma. Met. I don't cough as much as I used to since I quit smoking. Oh, wow, really? Yeah. Imagine that. Is yeah. that the truth, TJ? Yeah. Oh, by the way, TJ is quitting Chantex, he told me. Oh, boy. I never anymore. said that. Yeah, you told me that, dude. You haven't, taken it for, you haven't taken me for. You, well, I, I, I you missed have not a taken days, it for a couple days, and you're like, when you take it again, you're like, I just took one this morning. All right, TJ. All right, TJ. All right, the DJ. We watching man. you though. I do not know about this TJ. But uh, you know, you know what's what? Going I am. On. Uh, I'm fucking killing you, TJ. I'm one month smoke free. All I have to do is do this eleven more times. That's a year, so that's fucking horrible. But all right. Anyway, um, <laughs> let's get to. Uh, we got a contest going. A little contest, mini contest, right, Scotty? This is something and you what, conceived of. And what could they win, TJ? This this what? came right out of Scotty's heart. He, was, he came in and the Leave It well, to Beaver the, tune uh, started playing. He was like, gee whiz, guys, I feel like giving something back to the fans. And we were like, like what? How about a cool prize like the HP Lovecraft collection? A nice Ooh. hardbound collection of Six all of... Six volumes, dude. HP Lovecraft's uh, famous writings. Yeah. HP uh, Lovecraft you know, collection. Well, I figured if you're watching this episode, you're probably a fan of HP Lovecraft. Or at least I'm you're going to be. Maybe, hopefully. So, uh, yeah, this is, uh, we got two. There's going to be two winners, right? Yep, that's correct. There's going to be one winner from our public comment section uh, down below. Um, all you have to do, tell them what they got to do, Scotty. Okay, so you have to answer a simple question, which you should be able to do. Uh, maybe, like I said, if you're not a fan of H.P. Lovecraft, this might be a little more difficult. But uh, what is your favorite Lovecraft story or character? And uh, bonus points, if you describe how the character or story would drive one of the pessimists insane. Or maybe a little bit more insane, because we're all pretty fucking crazy here. Nice. Cool. I like it. So you can answer that uh, in the uh, comment section down below of this YouTube video, and you have a chance to win this HP Lovecraft collection if we like your answer. Uh, You also have... we also asking the same question exclusively to patrons. Which, of course, have a much better chance of actually winning. Yeah, because it's a smaller pool of people. exclusive club. And uh, love to the patients. feel free to enter twice if you want to. By the way, yeah. But uh, the only thing I don't is think that you're going to win both. But obviously, you have to be you a can patron. Double your chances, I guess. And if you're a public figure, you have to be subscribed to our channel. That's it. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, the only criteria is if you are if you do the public one, if we go to your channel, we got to see you're subscribed to us. So if you're not subscribed, be sure to subscribe. 
And if you're not subscribed, fuck you. Like, fuck what the fuck? Yo. Yeah, you get no HP Lovecraft. You don't need no fucking HP you Lovecraft. You don't get the complete works of, of HP bitch. Lovecraft. You don't get shit. You son of a fucking bitch. Why does it keep wanting to save his draft? I'm just going to publish the fucker thing. Publish. I don't know, dude. It's weird. I'm publishing it. Dude, I kind of want to win this. Maybe I'll masquerade <laughs> somebody and write a, a really good one. You know what? If you do, fuck it, man. Sweet. <laughs> whatever, whatever. If you fool us, man, more power to you. It won't publish, man. It's being stupid. Man, that's fucking dumb, dude. It's fucking stupid. So clearly this episode is about H.P. Lovecraft. <clears throat> like a writer that, I don't know, uh, I know TJ's read it. I know you know I'm what right. H.P. Lovecraft stands for, Scott? Paul, have you, uh, yes, I do. Uh, Paul, have you read H.P. Lovecraft at all? Yes. Okay, cool. So I guess we were all on the same I page. have not read all of H.P. Well, Lovecraft, but uh, I've read quite a bit of H.P. Lovecraft. TJ, what about you? I think, have you read a lot of it or just a couple stories? Um, <clears throat> I would say that, um, look, I mean, I can, I've read, I've read the call of, uh, how how is Cthulhu properly pronounced, guy? <laughs> Cthulhu. Yeah, you get, I don't know how to do it, but it's it's weird. Dude. Right, it's like you gotta so, um, scream. Shit. I've read Call of Cthulhu. I've read uh, the Outsider. I've read uh, the uh, what's the one with the rats or something? Um, All the rats in the walls. Yeah, I've read the rats in the walls, um, and I've read. Um, like I've read a bunch of the other one, like the color out of space, the mountains of badness. I've read, of I've read in a lot of the short of story stuff that he wrote. Well, I, he didn't. He, he was pretty much what he did. Right, right. Uh, so, but I jump around from you know they might appear in different anthologies and stuff. But yeah, I like at, at the mountains of madness. I like um, the Dunwich Horror. Yeah, I like Dagon. Yeah, I read Dagon too. Um, <laughs> you know, those are the those are the ones that are the most memorable to me. Those three, I probably read several other uh, you know Lovecraft works. Yeah, uh, I've read. I mean, I don't know. I've probably read like fucking ten or fifteen of his stories. Yeah, over pretty the much years. similar. Like, I mean, like, so, I mean, it's not like I've. I'm not I can't really say. World, I can't but. really say that I've gone through and exhaustively, uh, you know, gobbled up every word he ever wrote. But I mean, uh, I've definitely paid. Well, visits maybe to all it. of us need to uh, go ahead and get this edition ourselves. <laughs> Lovecraft is like a mood thing for me, right? You know what I mean? Like, and if you're not, I c- I couldn't sit down and like binge Lovecraft. I would go insane, mad. I would go mad, mad. Yeah. So, uh, Hank Polarius Lovecraft was born in. No, go ahead, TJ, Scott. what the fuck, dude? Hank Polarius? Yeah, Hank Polarius Lovecraft. That's what HP stands for. It is not, dude. Oh, Hewlett Packard. I'm sorry. Hewlett Packard Lovecraft. I thought about doing a fake out when we said HP and just having an HP computer come up, but <laughs> you, you went there. You went. You went. Oh, lame. he he he. You went lamer than I did for. Yeah, me. I did. Yeah, so good. I always go lamer than you, Scotty. So this is a quote from HP Lovecraft. Gotta get that lame which dollar. I think, which I think. Uh, that's a good kind of summary of him as a person. Uh-huh. The oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear. And Water. the oldest and strongest kind of fear is the fear of the unknown. Mm. You don't know. <clears throat> and he definitely tried to uh, capitalize that in his works. So this is little HP Lovecraft, Howard Phillips Lovecraft, with his parents. Looks like a girl. Yeah, I, I actually had to look at that a couple times. So I was like, is this actually? But no, this is actually him. So HP Lovecraft was born Howard Phillips Lovecraft in 1890 in Providence, Rhode Island. Was he dressed like a girl? His whole life? Um, actually, gender kind of specific clothing for children didn't come about at this time. So this time when he was born... What about gender specific hairstyles? I guess not either. Well, this is probably a masculine hairstyle for the time, dude. He's a, oh. He was a masculine little boy. He looks manly as shit. I mean, shit. Not, not really. Uh, Lovecraft had an unusual childhood marked by tragedy. He was the only child of Winfield Scott Lovecraft, which is pictured here, and Sarah Susan, Susie Phillips Lovecraft. Uh... Though his employment is hard to discern, uh, discern, Lovecraft's future wife, Sonia Green, stated that Winfield was employed by the Gorham Manufacturing Company as a traveling salesman. Uh, I looked into them. Just, they basically sell, like, silverware and ta- tableware. It's like it's silver shit. Right. Uh, so basically... So his daddy went around selling forks and yeah, shit. Yeah, wasn't around very much, but he was selling shit. Uh, and she came for money. Uh, Susie's family was of substantial means. At the time of their marriage, her father, which I love this dude's name, Whipple Van Buren Phillips. <laughs> Whipple. She, look at him. And this is him. This is Whipple <laughs> Van Buren. I'm like, dude, I th- when I was looking at this episode, I was like, man, they just don't make people like Whipple Van no. <laughs> Buren Phillips they anymore, dude. He's just, just men the, like this aren't born <laughs> the anymore. The walrus stash, just proud. God damn, what a man. Whipple <laughs> Van Buren Phillips, man. Dude, I just yeah. When I saw that dude, dude, I'm gonna dude. If I ever do accidentally have a child by some miracle, I'm naming it Whipple. <laughs> It'll probably the only. Yeah, one name is Whipple. Whipple Parky. So uh, he was involved in many significant business ventures. Uh, in 1893, after a psychotic episode in a Chicago hotel, Winfield was committed to Butler Hospital in Providence. Uh, 
Though it was not clear who reported Winfield's behavior prior to the, the hospitalization, medical <coughs> records indicate that he had been doing this and saying strange things at times. So like, he was kind of going like off his rocker. So he went nuts. You yeah. know what? And then he just had an episode where he, just, he had just a, a total break. Yeah, he went total bat shit. You know why, though? Because he got... Diabetes. That's, uh, that's why. That's actually not why. Uh, he got the diabetes, dude. Oh my he was God. a traveling <laughs> salesman. Uh, <laughs> he looks like Wilfred And he developed Brimley. a mental disorder caused by untreated syphilis. Um, oh, hot. So when he when he was around the age of three, this is basically when Lovecraft was three. And in 1893, his father Untreated became a patient treated syphilis at Bo- uh, Butler Hospital in Providence and remained there until his death in 1898. <coughs> so basically five years. He was committed in 1893 and he died in 1898. Um, so basically, a lot of people describe his marriage uh, to Susie as that it was a very uh, loveless marriage. So like he basically had to fuck women on the road. Like he was, oh. so he was off, and of course then he got. I mean, him having syphilis kind of. Makes you believe that that version of ancestry. I mean, obviously this is speculation, but that kind of makes sense. He had untreated syphilis and obviously lost his mind because debilitating syphilis eventually causes these symptoms. Cool. Damn. Uh, so you want to see, see H.P. Lovecraft at nine, TJ? There you go. See him at nine, which is just TJ basically. Yeah, this, this is, is what TJ looks like in all his childhood. This photos. is eighteen ninety nine TJ. Right Same uh, page boy haircut too. The squire is attending the night <coughs> even back then. Yeah, what TJ. would it take to actually get you to do this haircut right here? What? What, what, what would it take? Did you get this what? Hair, to get this haircut right here? An order from me and a cuff about his face is what it would take. Ha <laughs> ha. Um. All right, I'll do it if you. So uh, realistically. All right. I'll do it, but only if Paul shaves all of his body hair off. I'll his take the body. razor to you myself, sir. <laughs> He's got to shave his entire body. I'll hairless. hold you down like the maggot you are in the dust, and I'll shave your putrid face for you, sir. No, Damn, cut dude. your bangs, sir. What are you rambling about, you psycho? Give you a proper psycho page boy, TJ. Cut. This is like Burnside Paul's, dude. <laughs> I don't know what this is supposed to be. <laughs> Gorilla. It's Gorilla. Holy shit. Sorry. Whoa, just, did Jesse James make an appearance? Yeah, I guess there was still some stuff left over from when we did that episode. Cuff you about the ears, sir. Give you a good scrubbing. Scrubbing. Give you a good snipping, sir. That's what how, you need. how Paul like promoted the Gorilla shit on the show. Like, yeah, I'll come out, you know. A good cuff about the ears is what you need, squire. Every time I go click on one of his streams, I'm like, is he going to be doing Gorilla? And then he's always like, man, world and... Pain Forgotten your place. I'm like, oh, well, really, dude? I think like Gorilla possesses Paul. I don't think Paul even has any sort of have choice. Any we talked about this on the last yeah, show, man. You're choice, just di- you're you're digging at me about this Gorilla shit. You act like I'm responsible. It's the people that have to bring the opponents to Gorilla. If they're not doing it, then when he's not out there looking to fight, you know, you know the nature of Gorilla. Mm. Yeah, he's peaceful. Mm. He's a peace loving just sort of gorilla. He doesn't want to harm anyone, but people come at him, and if they come at him, they know what's going to happen. So he had a second tragic loss, right? Oh yeah. So, but, but we're going to get to that. So a sickly child. Yeah, sickly. Uh, Lovecraft spent many of his hour uh, school years at home. So basically, he was a homebody. Mm. He became an avid reader, devouring works on a variety of texts. Uh, one of his favorites was Edgar Allan Poe, uh, which is not surprising considering the career he would later go on to have. Of course, as a horror writer himself. Uh, he developed a special interest in astronomy. As a teenager, he did attend Hope High School, but he sur- uh, suffered a nervous breakdown before he could earn his diploma. Damn. Uh, at this time, he kind of became very reclusive, staying up late to study you know, b- various texts on astronomy, he is TJ, dude. chemistry. Uh, TJ, are you H.P. Lovecraft reincarnated? I mean, we both uh, have initials as our first name. Yeah, yeah. TJ. H.P. <laughs> TJ you know? Kirkcraft. Uh, both of us couldn't finish high school because of our nervous breakdowns. Yeah. Although I didn't really have a nervous breakdown, I just didn't want to go anymore. Yeah, poor, there's poor no, marks. There's no the, TJ. There's no reason to be ashamed of your nervous breakdown. You don't have to hide it anymore. All right. All right. You're in your 30s. Uh, and also during this time, he managed to publish some articles on astronomy in several newspapers. So he was always an interesting. <coughs> even from a very young age, he had a into the occult, just like TJ. The occult. into a lot of things, into science a lot too. Just really kind of interested in science, and then later on in his life would be frustrated. I think writing was kind of a way to deal with that too. Uh, uh, with the death of Lovecraft's father, uh, the upbringing of the boys fell to his mother, his two aunts, and especially to his grandfather, the prominent industrialist. Show him again, dude, <laughs> just for the sake of it. Whipple. Whipple Van Buren Phillips. Diabetes. Uh, Lovecraft was a precocious youth. He was reciting poetry at age two, reading at age three. Of course, this is, I'm not, I guess I'm sure this is true, but this is just, it sounds <coughs> nice. Uh, writing at age of six or seven. Uh, but this is what we do know. His earliest enthusiasm was for Arabian Nights. That was his kind of first, like, well, I really like this kind of storytelling. Which is maybe not what people would expect, but 
I mean, those are some very interesting. And, and honestly, Arabian Nights, I've read some of them, are actually pretty graphic and gory in details. Like, Aladdin, oh, yeah. Even the story of Aladdin is a lot more brutal than it's made out to be in the Disney version. Yeah, in the original version, Aladdin totally straight up just rapes Jasmine up the butt. It's crazy. There's a lot more violence, let's just say. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, yeah. And he read it by the age of five. Uh, it was at that time he, devel- he adapted the pseudonym, or ad- uh, I don't know if it's adapted, but it should be adopted, the pseudonym, Abdul Abazard. Abazard. Or Abazred. Abazred the Lama. Obviously, I suck at pronouncing these names. Abdul Zabaro Jibidi Da. And the works of Lovecraft became the author of the Necronomicon. Cool. Uh, the next year, however, his Arabian interests were eclipsed by the study of Greek mythology, uh, gleaned through uh, Bullfinch's Age of Fable and through uh, the, a children's version of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Whoa. Uh, and actually, his earliest surviving literary work is called The Poem of Ulysses from 1897. So that's his actually... And he was only at that time seven years old, remember? Wow. And it's basically a paraphrase of the Odyssey and 88 lines of internal rhyming verse. That's not bad. So, I mean, he was a pretty bright kid. I mean, to be able to have already, like, do that shit. Like, I was yeah, no I was, wonder public high school caused him to have a fucking mental breakdown. I'm surrounded by idiots! Ah! <laughs> Dude, I, I don't know anybody that didn't have at least <coughs> one mental breakdown going through high school. Yeah. It, it's like kind of a rite of passage to reach that boiling point. Because it's it really is a bullshit factory. Just the people that go all suck. The teachers all <laughs> suck. The environment sucks. So. I'm not ready for that yet. Uh, so basically by that time, uh, Lovecraft already discovered weird fiction. His first story... Uh, the Noble Eavesdropper made date as early as 1896. Mm. Uh, his interest in the weird was fostered by his grandfather. <laughs> Whipple! Yeah, Whipple. Uh, who entertained Lovecraft with off-the-cuff weird tales in gothic mode, which is basically like just creepy weird stories. So this guy was in that shit, too. Yeah, he kind of had like kind of... Pat- he was like, a warlock. Yeah, like, this is some weird shit. He was a, a disciple of the old ones, and he planted uh. the seed into HP so he uh. could spread the gospel. So when he was young, um, like I said, he was obviously very lonely, and he suffered with frequent illness, uh, illnesses, uh, right. many of them apparently psychological. So like he had nervous breakdowns, he had nervous tics. Mm. He had a lot of issues like that, like where he just like he was very antisocial, right? You know, just kind of kept in his own world. Uh, and of course, like we already talked about, this published in the scientific journals. Let's see what the next one is. So in 1904, uh, the death of Lovecraft's grandfather Whipple Van Buren Phillips, uh, and the Whipple, sub- and the subsequent mismanagement of his property and affairs plunged Lovecraft's family into severe financial difficulties. So they basically Damn. they went from living in his palatial estate, which I mean. Someone of his means and the way like he carried himself, you can tell like he was a gentleman to a cr- uh, cramped duplex. Uh, so then basically uh, him and his mother were forced to move into a, from their lavish Victorian home into cramped quarters at 1598 uh, Angel Street. Damn, Lovecraft- that happened to us, too. Yep. The fuck? Lovecraft was devastated here. by the loss of his birthplace and apparently contemplated suicide and took long bicycle rides and looked out wistfully at the watery depths of the Barrington River. Damn. So it became very well. I mean, imagine like you're living, yeah, you're living this luxurious lifestyle. You kind of want for nothing. You just get to study and pursue whatever interests you, and now you're just living in squalor. Now you're just living in a shithole, staring at the river, fucking thinking about blowing your brains out and shit. So TD is, is also like you. So in, in 1908, obviously had the nervous breakdown. He was actually compelled to leave school, so he never got his diploma, never graduated high school. TJ, right. I don't know. How do you feel about that, TJ? You feel like it really held you back in life? Because I mean, look, no. You don't. You don't think. You don't think it did, dude. No. All right, dude. I'm, dude. I, I, I'm, dude. I'm fucking. I'm sorry, dude. To hear that. Oh yeah, TJ. What's two plus two? Uh, seven. <laughs> what a retard. Damn so it. after high school, Lovecraft doesn't really do much. Uh, from 1908 to 1913. Oh, he doesn't do much. Why are we doing an episode about him then? Eh? Well, he didn't do eh? much for this time period. After high school, nothing after high school. Not his really. Entire dude. life. Uh, he was okay. a virtual hermit. Okay, cool. Doing a little safe pursuing his astronomical uh, interests. All right. Basically, and, he, and he, very, he had a very unhealthy relationship with his mother at this time, who was basically dealing with the death of her husband and her, obviously her grandfather. And they had a very kind of comorbid relationship. Oh, wow. Like, they barely left the house. You know, they were just not good for each other. Oh, here, so he's like a... Uh, says here they developed a pathological love-hate relationship. He's like so a, it's like Norman Bates kind of shit yeah, going Norman, on. Yeah, like H.P. Lovecraft Bates despised... Like, heat, he despised going outside during this time. Like, he didn't want to be in the sunlight. He preferred artificial lights on him. Oh, yeah, I totally agree with him there. You know, they, they, and like, like I said, they just fought. I am relating more and more to this guy. See? A, lot, a, 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 strong, a strong history of mental illness in their family. Clearly. Cool. I mean, I guess it's not cool, but it's cool. Damn, TJ. 
Led to some cool ass books. It sure did. Dude. That's why mental illness gets a bum rap. Because like this could you think this motherfucker could have invented all the shit that he did if he wasn't fucked up in the head? Like how come everyone wants our artists to be sane nowadays? Fuck that shit. We need crazy motherfuckers creating things. Well, it's not like they've ever stopped doing that. I know. And they're not going to. But I mean, I just I just look at the way that like Kanye West is treated now. Where it's like, oh, he's nuts. He's nuts. Yeah, fucking he's supposed to be nuts. Not only that, but well, whatever. Not to get too anyway. far afield. But Kanye has just come right out and admitted to it. And he's talked openly about what he suffers from and shit. So let him be. Yeah. Let him be that. Yeah, just let him be out there doing his crazy thing. But no, everything's got to conform to some rigid standard of bullshit. But, that's, but that's, that's the role that those people are supposed to play, and that's the role he's supposed to play. Yeah, well, to I think those people should all die in a I, fucking there's, fire. There's always people who have a very conventional view of what it's every time they live in, and like, this is how all yeah, people live, trash. and this is how people are supposed to live. And, and this they're person, fucking trash, Scotty. Well, that's your opinion, TJ. A lot of people think that's the it's right a, way to it, live. It's Stay a philosophical question that begs, you know, discussion. You know, the idea of... Su- great suffering creates great art and when it comes to suffering you know mental pain is one of the most common ways that people do suffer and is it should we stamp that out in people if we can you know should we should we treat people to the point where there is no mental illness and would that remove some of that dark perspective that people like uh, HP Lovecraft have they all deserve I to mean, die I mean I don't even know I mean, that's like what well, what you're saying now is even feasible at this point. You know, right? You can't just do away. I mean, also Hitler kind of tried. Even if you did away with just necessarily mental illness, weirdos. you're not going to do away with tragedy. You're not going. I mean, like unless you do away with all accidents and loss and. Oh well, yeah. I mean, like a lot. Obviously, in his life, talking about people having outlets to go to other than becoming hermits and you know living with their mother for years on end, which clearly led his mind in some interesting directions. But I mean, clearly. it was probably a pretty miserable existence as well. Yep. Well, I don't think you do that because you're happy. Yeah, but would we have the Cthulhu mythos if he hadn't done that? There you go, TJ. Get ahead of yourself, TJ. So this this section entitled in honor of TJ, an edge lord is born. Woo! He you know he's basically he just w- like Mother Teresa at this point. Yeah, I really like suffering. Let, let them wallow in their own misery and make cool fucking metal music and then blow their brains out. Yeah, I mean, dude, this dude reminds me so much <laughs> of TJ. This is like TJ if he lived fucking you know a hundred years ago. So really? honestly, I I felt that way very strongly <laughs> about love. Chia J, dude. Chia J. Is this your way of tricking me into caring about this subject? Actually, Chi J H P Craft. <laughs> so Lovecraft emerged from his hermitry in a very peculiar way. What do you no, do? no, no. Listen to his life story and tell All me right. this doesn't remind you of you at least in some respect because okay. it honestly did to me. Okay. Uh, having taken to reading the early pulp magazines of the day, he became so incensed by the insipid love stories of one Fred uh, Fred Jackson and the Argosy that he wrote a letter. In the in verse attacking Jackson. All right, yeah, that does sound like something. I'd this do. letter was published in 1913 and evoked a storm of protest from Jackson's <laughs> defenders. Lovecraft engaged in a heated debate uh, he in the letter column of the Argosy and its associated magazines. Oh. Lovecraft's response is almost being uh, in a rollicking heroic uh, couplets reminiscent of Dryden and Pope. <laughs> So he wrote. He, he was basically done in a very poetic way. He was very, dissing people. He wrote him a poem. Form. He wrote them a poem. Yes, he wrote him a poem. Essentially, <laughs> I love it. Uh, this controversy was noted by Edward F. Das, president of the United Amateur Press Association, the UAPA, a group of amateur writers from around the country who wrote and published their own magazines, which was a, kind of a big thing at the time. Right. That's uh, kind of like the YouTube of the day. Yeah. Das invented Lovecraft to join the UAPA, and Lovecraft did so in early 1914. Uh, Lovecraft published 13 issues of his own paper. Cool. Which I thought was pretty cool. So it's like he basically like is just sitting around reading this shit. And is like, you know what? This guy fucking sucks. Why is this guy popular? <laughs> I should be that motherfucker. And I'm gonna writes, write a poem attacking. All right, him. and not even an angry, an angry poem. Dude, he is TJ. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Dude, this was TJ's early YouTube career. <laughs> Why are these fucking idiots popular? I could do this better. And starts attacking everybody and dividing the whole community up and then <laughs> blowing it all so up. Like, and he's, shit. he's the edge. Uh, HP Lovecraft was the edge trolling. Time, dude. Come the whole way through with a big shit-eating grin on his face. Dude, this is TJ. You're right. Uh, the question is, what is TJ's fucking Cthulhu mythos? I don't know, dude. I don't think I've done it yet. You haven't made it yet? Yeah. You're not at that point yet in the arc? I don't you know think what someone so, asked about, You haven't TJ? written your Margaritaville yet? I thought TJ's uh, magnum was going to be Whiskey and Guns, dude. Whiskey and Guns. What's Whiskey and Guns? It's a movie idea. TJ's oh. Western concept. Got it. 
I don't really have a story for it. I just have a collection of scenes. Then I expect some fucking Quentin uh, Tarantino esque shit, dude. Okay. I expect you to blow me a fucking way, dude. Knock my socks off. Want me to blow you? Blow me away, dude. Gross, Scotty. That's not what that means, TJ. I don't feel that way. Okay, TJ, you're you're disgusting. (laughs) Uh, It was in the amateur world that Lovecraft uh, recommenced their art, uh, the writing of fiction. Excuse me. Which he had abandoned in 1908. So yeah, for a time period, he was just basically writing a lot of letters. He wasn't really doing uh, going his, his roots of writing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so W. Paul Cook and others, noting the promise shown in early tales such as The Beast in the Cave, that's 1905, The Alchemist, 1908, urged Lovecraft to pick his fictional pen up again. This, Lo- this Lovecraft did writing The Tomb and Dagon in quick succession in the summer of 1917. Dagon's pretty good. I never heard. I never read the tomb, so I don't know about that one. Yeah, I've not read that one either, actually. But I have read Dagon. That was pretty cool. Uh, thereafter, Lovecraft kept up a steady, if sparse, flow of fiction. Although, until at, at least in 1922, poetry and essays were still his dominant mode of literary expression. So, like I said, he was really into poetry and essays, and just kind of like ar- like more like argumentative kind of things. Right. Uh, Lovecraft also became involved in the ever-increasing network of correspondence with friends and associates, eventually became one of the greatest and most prolific writer, uh, writer, excuse me, yeah, writer writers Yeah, I did know that about country. him. This guy, uh, he was way more, in, maybe because he didn't really have much of a social life, uh, like on a personal level, he was super into correspondence uh, yes. with other people, other writers. Well, we're talking about, I actually talk about one of the, his main pen pals, which is Robert E. Howard, the uh, creator of the yes. Conan series and other uh, works, and... They exchanged. I couldn't f- actually find um, any of the letters online, but there's actually a book about it, and they exchanged. I think over a thousand pages of letters. Like right. it's, it's very extensive. Right. So they really fucking. But I mean, that was just one of his correspondence. Yes. So oh, I just mean, like, one of many. His writing talents. Most of them, he he kind of uh, spent just writing letters to uh, people he knew or people that he, you know. Most of them he'd probably never met in real life. Probably never met their entire lives, but. Exchanged it, well, that, vigorous it, it, letter if you think about it, like with them. Oh, it's it, a social network. Yeah, yeah, it's like the social this, yeah. network. Yeah, it's like Twitter of the time is like sending people, you know, screeds about how retarded they are and how much their writing sucks or how much you love their writing. too. Yeah. yeah how much you adore them or how much you, <clears throat> you know what I mean? That that was the kind of the way you did it back then. Yeah. And plus, you know, there's a networking element to that, too, because <clears throat> he's trying to climb that ladder. So. Sure. So he's trying to make allies within that uh, that community of writers. So another reoccurring theme in H.P. Lovecraft's life, loss. So again, if you put, I pull a picture of his mother now. Where is it? Uh, nope. That's, that's not her. Go left. Damn. Go left. I don't think you pulled a picture of her. I thought I did. Okay. Nope. We'll go back to the original one, the first one with him and as a uh, this ch- as a child. Okay. That one more. One more. Oh, you mean like one that with his mom? Yeah. Next with his... There we go. Uh, so Lovecraft's so mother. Honor. Her mental and physical condition deteriorating, suffered a nervous breakdown, sound familiar, in 1919, and was admitted to Butler Hospital, uh, like her husband, basically where she would die. So her, her and her husband died in pretty much a very similar fashion, had, had a mental breakdown, they went to the sanitarium. Uh, her death on May Mental 20- breakdown seemed to be a big thing in the Lovecraft On May family. 24th, damn, it's almost the exact day she died, uh, 1921, uh, however, was the result of a bungled gallbladder operation. Hmm. So she was uh, basically sent there, but that wasn't actually the reason to kill her. She was just, you know, trying to re- recuperate, and then they, I guess, for some reason, had to operate on her gallbladder, and she died during the subsequent surgery. Cool. Um, he was obviously very shattered by this loss because he had a very close relationship with his mother. But a few weeks later, he'd recovered enough to attend an amateur journalism convention in Boston on July fourth, nineteen twenty-one. That's cool. You know, it's kind of sad too because like mental breakdown don't tell you shit right. about what these people were actually suffering from. It's just a catch-all term because there was really no modern medical diagnosis for these types of right. things back yeah. then, we don't or know it was just it starting all. to be explored. You know what I mean? So, who knows like what it was? It could be any number of things. You know, the like- way that he writes about insanity constantly. I have to imagine he pulled some of that from his real life. I'm, I'm sure. And oh, yeah. if that's the case, hallucinations, maybe they were schizophrenic. You know what I mean? Could maybe be. they uh, saw or heard things that weren't there. I mean, that would seem in, in fitting with uh, what I he mean, obviously, the loss of sanity became a major theme in his work. So, And and as we all know, none of this happens overnight. I mean, he obviously dealt with this. Like I said, they were living together. He dealt with this for years. And, I mean, obviously... They had an unhealthy relationship, and he might have played a part in that, you know, worsening. Maybe he made it better. We don't really know. I mean, obviously, no one was in that home but them, so 
it's kind of hard to speculate. But yeah, I mean, assuredly, it's probably some mental illness that was undiagnosed. Right. But I'm assuming he takes the death of his mother pretty fucking hard. He does, but I would say compared to someone we're going to talk about a little bit later, probably not as bad. I mean, like he kind of like, like I guess he was able to process it a little bit better. I mean, like one of the things about him is he was he was kind of very in his own world. He's kind of detached. Right. Not well, a very I, emotional I mean, it, it sounds person. like at that point he had kind of his own life going a little bit. Yeah, so it, it wasn't was like, like he was able to. It wasn't recover. like she died in that period where he was super dependent on her. Right. He kind of had at least so they didn't something have that going kind on of beyond. Relationship. Yeah, I mean, like he he started some of his correspondences and had found. A, I mean, it's just a strange. Bit of a voice in the world. It at that speaks point. to like a, a distant, uh, like a distant nature in him, I guess. Then, because typically, you know, Scotty described a codependent relationship between he and his mother, uh-huh. and even though they can be miserable together, codependent people off are often horribly aggrieved by the loss of that, you know, because it's just like right. the interruption of their entire life. But I guess he was detached uh, from that in a way that um, maybe those types. Well, of Well, it says he was pretty shattered by it. I mean, I mean, he was definitely. Obviously, I, it didn't last. I, that I don't want to. Yeah, I, I don't want to underscore that. But I mean, like, I, I just think that he. It was wasn't like, like he was like your mom's dead. And he's like, oh, I cannot function any longer. I see. You know, it was like, cause, like I said, a few weeks later, he was able to go to. I mean, and look, you know, anyone that's experienced a loss in their life knows that you know some people can go. You know what? It's really hard, but I'm going to keep living my life. And some people just shut down, like I can't do anything. They, they become fixated on death and that loss. So I mean, I I I, I, I guess based on what his actions were, that, that's why I erred on the side of I think he had enough detachment from it to say that's really sad and I'm really depressed. And but I need to move on with my life. You know, she's gone and I need I need to move forward and still do things. Uh, so it was on this occasion at this uh, uh, basically at this conference uh, that he met his wife or basically his future wife. Sonia Haft Green was a Russian Jew, seven years Lovecraft senior. Russian Jew. But the two seemed at her. least initially to find themselves uh, basically very congenial. Like they had a, like, kind of like, now he was always kind of like, you know, one of those guys where it's like, I think that she was obviously interested in him, pursued him, and he kind of just realized eventually, like, oh, like I want to have a relationship with you kind of thing. Is where he has to be explicitly okay. told. I believe that is. Sonia, okay. It is, that is her. Uh, so Lovecraft visited Sonia in her Brooklyn apartment in 1922, and the news of their uh, marriage on March 3rd, 1924, was not entirely a surprise to their friends, but it had been to Lovecraft's two aunts, uh, Lillian D. Clark and Anna E. Phillips Gamwell. These people have such fascinating fucking <laughs> na- the ex- kind of names you would definitely expect. Uh, who were only notified by a letter the ceremony had taken place. So it's kind of just like, hey, fam, uh, I'm fucking married now. Yo, I'm married. You know, and this, uh, and honestly, he had one of those very controlling families, so it's like, this is kind of an act of rebellion. So it's right? basically just like, yo, fuck you, I'm you know, married. I, yeah, like, I don't need to fucking put up your guys' bullshit. I'm married to this chick. I'm living in fucking New York. I'm fucking, I'm out of Providence. Fuck this shit. Uh, so he moves to Brooklyn, uh, and the initial prospects of the couple seemed pretty good. Uh, Lovecraft had gained a foothold as a professional writer by the acceptance of several of his early stories in Weird Tales. Which we're gonna talk about weird tales in a little while, you know, or show, show some of his, uh, the images from those uh, pulp magazines. Uh, the sol- uh, celebrated pulp magazine that was founded in 1923. Uh, Sonia actually ran a successful hat shop on Fifth Avenue in New York, which is prime New York real estate. Cool. So they were actually doing pr- initially, like it was kind of like, yeah, you know, everything's making sense. Initially, yeah, I'm, it sounds like another shoe is gonna drop here the way uh, you're talking about it. So well, another, maybe another hat is going to drop. Another uh, hat's gonna drop. Oh uh, shit! But of course, in typical fashion for his life. He he came overcame one adversary, uh, uh, basically adversity just to be fall right into the lap of uh, another. Uh, troubles descended uh, descended upon the couples almost immediately. The hat, sh- hat shot went bankrupt due to her illness. Uh, Lovecraft surprisingly turned down the chance to edit a ca- uh, companion magazine to Weird Tales, uh, which w- would have necessitated a move to Chicago. So probably like I don't want to move. Her health gave way, forcing her to spend some time in a New Jersey sanitarium. And uh, Lovecraft attempted to secure work, but. Few people are willing to hire a 34 year old man with no job experience. Sure. So he had a job opportunity, turned that down. Her business goes belly up because she's sick and she can't run it anymore. And he doesn't really have any experience to just go get a regular job. He can't go become a grocer. He can't go do it. He doesn't have any experience in any other fields. So on January 1st, 1925, uh, Sonia went to Cleveland to take a job up there. And Lovecraft moved into a single apartment near the seedy Brooklyn area called Red Hook, <laughs> which is like a, a very immigrant heavy area, like where people fresh right. off the boat. Uh, moved to. Right. Uh, so all the Lovecraft had many friends in New York. Uh, and there's some Frank uh, Belknap Long, Reinhard Kleiner, Samuel Loveman. He became increasingly depressed by his isolation and the masses of foreigners in the city. Well, you moved to the foreigner section of the city. 
And this is where we're going to talk about, I guess, kind of the dark thing about H.P. Lovecraft, which is his racism. So just like TJ, he's a yeah. fucking racist. A total... I actually pulled an image for that, TJ. Where is it? A total uh, white nationalist. Uh, no, that's actually a picture of Sonya. Yep. Oh, you put it in the wrong section. Oh, well, all out of TJ, order, dog. Whatever. So there's a lot of arguments have been made about H.P. Lovecraft's uh, racism. And some people have said, well, this was contemporary for the time. And, you know, this was kind of normal. Ah, uh, uh, the context <laughs> view. Yeah, but well, a lot of people argue that I he mean, actually uh, went he much was, further than... Yeah, he actually members. probably went a little bit further than could sure. be excused just by the times. I um, mean, a lot of anti-Semitism as well. So not, yeah. not was racism. Um, so Lovecraft's hateful views were a major concern of his wife, Sonia Green. Who was Jewish, Who right? was Jewish. Uh, Sonia was extremely disturbed by Lovecraft's anti-Semitism and repeatedly raised the issue with Lovecraft as related in this Wired article that states, and this is from the article, Green told the biographer later that she had kept reminding Lovecraft about her own background, but it didn't seem to dissuade him from his fear of Jews and other immigrants. Uh, Sonia once confronted Lovecraft on how she was a member of a group he despised, to which he responded by saying she, quote, no longer belonged to those mongrels. You no longer belong to those mongrels. <laughs> kind of just like, yeah, you're from that stock, but you're not that anymore. Yeah. I have de Jewed you with my Lovecraft penis. <laughs> uh, and also from her, despite Sonya repeatedly raising these issues with Lovecraft, she later wrote, Whenever we found ourselves in a racially mixed crowds with character which characterized New York, Howard would become livid with rage. He almost seemed to almost lose his mind. So it just seems like honestly that a modern conservative married a modern liberal. <laughs> yeah. Honestly. I mean like there are ton they, like H.P. Lovecraft was almost certainly a racist, and he there was. are tons of other people in the society at that time. Maybe even the preponderance of uh, people in his, uh, you know, socioeconomic group at that time probably felt similarly. I don't know. I don't know that like I've heard anything that wouldn't be excused by the normal anti-immigrant sentiment that was right. rampant in New York pretty much always. Yeah, which pretty much always always been you know, for the most most of its history. Right. It's been like a it's it's a you poor city mean? that a lot of I'm people I'm not excusing in. it. It's no, shit. No. But like, <laughs> you know, you're expecting this guy to be a diamond in the rough. He married one. <laughs> I guess he so, married somebody. Well, that had I mean, a he lived in New York, and obviously, if he was in racially mixed crowds, that means there was crowds of people willing to racially mix, at yes. least socially. And well, he, he was, it was something he was against. He was perturbed by it strongly. Yeah. Like he saw it the, the same way, you know, the same way that white people, you know, uh, rural white people see it now when they see Mexican people moving into town. You know, it's like they're coming oh, here, they're taking our jobs, they're replacing white people. This used to be a white area, now there's a bunch of, you know, this color or that color running around in it. It's ruining the community. It's a preoccupation that has echoes that, you know, continue to this day. I've known a bunch of people that are like this. Used to be a good Maybe not, like, law. as hardcore as he is. Well, we're going to go even deeper into his racism. Yeah, yeah so. that, this isn't even... That, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Oh, that's the tip? Oh. That's just uh, the tip. His well, letters hold overflow on, then. with anti-Semitic conspiracy theories on underground jury pitting the economic, social, and literary worlds of New York City against the, quote, Aryan race. He warned of the Jew who must be muzzled because he insidiously degrades and orientalizes robust Aryan civilization. His, symp his sympathies with rising fascism were equally transparent. Quote, Hitler's vision is romantic and immature, he stated, after the uh, Hitler became chancellor of Germany. Hmm. I know he's a clown, but God, I like the boy. Kind of sounds like people excusing their love of Trump these days, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. I mean, I hate to make the lame Trump Hitler it's comparison, Trump! but yeah. you know, I know. Let me just say, I know how lame that is. But I mean, and you do hear people say that about him, like, yeah, I mean, he's kind of a clown. He's kind of goofy. He's kind of this, but you know, I like what he stands I for, like or this or that. So, so he was. I mean, you know. I mean, uh, Lovecraft was basically one of those guys at that point. Yeah, you know? and his contempt for blacks ran even deeper. In his 1912 poem entitled On the Creation of Niggers, <laughs> the gods have just designed man and beast, creating blacks in semi-human form to populate the space in between. Ooh. Regarding <laughs> the domestic <laughs> terrorism of white minorities in predominantly black Alabama and Mississippi, he excused them for, quote, resorting to extra-legal measures such as lynching and intimid intimidation, because the legal machinery does not sufficiently protect them. He lamented these sole intentions as unfortunate, but nevertheless said that anything is better than the, the mongrelism. Mongrelization. Which, oh, mongrelization, excuse me. Which would mean hopeless deterioration of a great nation. Misgenation, misgenination 
permeates his letters and stories of his most corporeal fear. He insists that only pain and disaster could fr- come from mingling of black and white. So he wanted the races separate. He did not want anything, uh, not any, want any white people mixed with any other races. So he was like a white nationalist. Yes. Yeah, he's basically a white nationalist. Yeah, um, white you nationalist. Know, it's, it, it is. I mean, there are a lot of there are a lot of parallels there. I mean, they are still passing around the Jew conspiracy that the Jews are behind every social level oh, yeah. and everything. Definitely, it's world. definitely not, not hard to find uh, Jew Well, do you remember that fucking time? It was just stirring a ideology. I watched a JF stream, yeah. and I was just, like, skipping around to random points, and I could not find a point where they weren't saying the Jews were responsible for and something. that is why is the Jews... The Jew, the Jew, the Jew, the Jew, the Jew. The Jew. The Jew. I mean, the I'm Jew. just saying it's like the a Jew. modern... The the, this type of the thinking... Is that the Jew, is that? If there's a modern representation of this kind of thinking it still exists uh yeah as like far this as this isn't some anachronistic okay, uh, okay Paul I, t- I i talk about the jew but sometimes i talk about other saints too yeah, good for you jf <laughs> i'm glad you unblocked me jf <laughs> did, he, did he block you hell to the fuck yeah he <laughs> damn dude i don't even know why oh, we're getting off track here uh his fiction turns from the nostalgic the shunned house in 1924 which is also set in providence uh, to the bleak and misanthropic, the horror at Red Hook, which is, by the way, where he lived, Red Hook yeah, in, uh, in Brooklyn. And he, both in 1924, lay bare his feelings for New York, which obviously were not very positive. Finally, in early 1926, plans were made for Lovecraft to return to Providence. Uh, he missed so clearly. <laughs> this keenly. artwork is fucking re- freaking me the <laughs> fuck out, <man. laughs> Oh, come on, Paul. <laughs> but there was kind of, uh, there was kind of, a, yeah, go close up on his face, dude. It was kind of a rub, though. There was kind of a problem. Uh, where did Sonya fit into these plans? I don't know. No one seemed to know, least of all Lovecraft. Although he continued to profess his affection for her, he acquiesced when his aunts barred her from coming to Providence to start a business. <laughs> so his aunts were basically like, you can come back, sweetie, but you ain't bringing that Jewish bitch. Because obviously, I mean, like, look, look where he came from. They're not, they're not going to accept her. They don't want her in the family. Right. They so, don't want no and Jews he's so in desperate family. at this time to get out of Red Hook and get out of New York because he hates it so much that he ba- and he's broke. He doesn't have shit. Should have taken a job in Chicago. You moron. he basically agrees. He says, "You know what? I will leave my wife behind so I can come back to Providence." Okay, and that's what he did. So, uh, so mar- basically, he comes crawling back. He never, he never saw her again after this move. Uh, the marriage was essentially over, and divorce in 1929 was inevitable. Right. So they divorced. You know, he didn't want to fucking... He, he chose his aunts and living in Providence over his marriage. So, I mean, it's basically to be expected. It sounds like he couldn't hang in New York because he was too scared of all the minorities. Yeah, I mean, so that's... He's like, fuck I, this, I'm going home. It just... And, you know... I think that whole conflict between them of, like, his fear of minorities and her embracing of it is probably what right. ended it. He's like, I can't even hang it's Like, I'm just shit. going back to the white part of the United yeah. States. Yeah, I'm going back with I'm my white I'm going back ants. to my white peoples where I feel comfortable. I want my overbearing ants to take care of me. And, the, and like, like, obviously, he had that kind of pattern with people. He, he always kind of wanted someone to take care of him, <clears throat> to look after things. Like, right. You see in the time period, where, I mean, where he kind of descends into that, it's like, it's just totally like he's bitter and racist and isolated and just like, I hate this. I can't stand it. Like. I think it's because like he kind of really needs a life, but he needs someone that's kind of more tethered to reality than more stable than he is. Uh, so he basically returned to Providence on April 17, 1926, settling at 10 Barn Street north of Brown University. Uh, it was not to bury himself away as he had done in 1908 to 1913 period. So it wasn't a hermitry period, but he just wanted somewhere, I think, where right. he felt comfortable. Uh Rather the last time somewhere a little lighter, you know what I mean? Somewhere uh, where it's not quite so dark so outside. Dark, yeah, dark yeah, yeah. Somewhere with a lot of sunlight. Do you get my drift? <laughs> and and actually was a I mean, you can argue that maybe hey, he was a dick to his fucking uh, then you know, ex wife, but well, I guess they had divorced at that point. But it was actually a time of his most prolific writing. Right. Uh, so she was hold, her, her liberal ass was holding him back, uh, and, keeping yeah. him cucked. Probably living in actual fear of all the minorities around him kept him from exploiting that, uh, you know, that silly, well, not silly, but silly in comparison sort of fear, I guess, of. Uh, there is nothing silly about these headless corpses playing, <laughs> praying to a flaming skull. I mean, they don't really exist. So that's what makes them. No, silly. they do, TJ. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I you don't understand like, anything. I guess I don't. So, you know nothing, TJ. And this time period from 1926 on. And that's the greatest fear, fear of the unknown. From uh, 1926 mm-hmm. on, his. Uh, Life was pretty uneventful. He traveled uh, widely to various antiquarian sites around the eastern seaboard. He went to Quebec. 
He went to New England, Philadelphia, Charleston, St. Augustine. So definitely not, uh, definitely not retreating in the hermitry. No, he's actually traveling. There's pictures. He's of him going around. Florida. He's checking shit out. He's going. He's looking at taking a better look at the world. Um, uh, my understanding is, and I, I don't see anything in, it in your research, um, but I do. Uh, I do seem to recall reading uh, somewhere when I was reading about Lovecraft that um, that he actually maybe it was just being out of the city. That he his, his racist views kind of softened a little bit. That is true. Towards the end of his yeah, life, that actually is true. Like he like actually that. kind of uh, retreated. He walked. Him. He didn't totally walk it back and just be like, "I have seen the light and I'm enlightened now." But you well, know, his early works, black characters are like very mongrel, like they're very evil. Right. And then later on, he actually has sympathetic black. Right. Characters he actually starts to writing. write them like human beings and and see that humanity a little instead of just being like, yeah. oh, no, the black demon, the black demon is here to come kill me. The good yeah. white man. Uh, not to say that he, be, he, he, you know, he flipped the script and became some kind of progressive. But his racism did soften, I think, around this time. In his yeah, life. So this and this time period, he actually wrote the uh, Call of Cthulhu in yeah. 1926 at the Mountains of Madness. Pronounce it right, Scotty. I don't, I don't know how, dude. Scotty told me that um, there's some some people there, some people out there floating around in the ether that uh, that tr- try to p- talk, tell people this is the proper pronunciation of Cthulhu it, because that's basically what H.P. Lovecraft said, and yeah. it's it's supposedly some really weird shit, right? It's like Cthulhu or something like shit like that. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a horrible impression of what I heard, but it's like it's shit like that. Oh God, whatever. Yeah, I just say that's my understanding was always that it was written to not be pronounceable. But dude, the people that are super into anything are annoying like that. Oh yeah, when you find people that literally like they've they've made it the study of their life to be like anime people or whatever it is. I I just bring up anime because it's the one I run into the most. Oh, the first the first time I saw an actually anime person, TJ was like. We were at uh, like a place called Suncoast Videos, and she was was horrible. I remember. And she was buying like an anime. It's like. Uh, yeah, do you have any dub versions? Uh, actually, <laughs> subtitle versions are the way that most uh, true anime fans come to appreciate anime. <laughs> it's like, I don't give a shit. You see that most of these voice actors, look, they're just doing a, a poor translation of what's actually being said. And you get the full context and understand the series as it's meant to be viewed. Uh, the closest way for you would be at subtitles. I mean, you can do whatever you want. You can watch it however you enjoy it. But I personally would think it's subtitles. It was actually. Not, that was, it was not like that. It was more like... You are an imbecile if you do not <laughs> enjoy the subtitled versions. For the actors in the dubbed versions are vastly inferior, and I prefer to enjoy it as its creators originally intended. And I was like, I was like, so its creators originally intended your your eyes to constantly be drawn to the bottom of the screen reading. Uh, well, uh, oh, oh, oh. And then he got all huffy. I don't think he said anything else. Yeah. Uh. To The Shadow of Time, which was 1934-35. Dude, there's so many actually people in the internet. Actually. I love, I love the actually crowd. Actually. This should be our new fucking... This should be the official actually. flag of the internet. Just slap this on a fucking flag. God, it's gotta be at this point. Uh, okay, anyway, sorry. Back to Lovecraft. Uh, but he uh, continued to prodigiously uh, his vast correspondence, which we said mm-hmm. like he's one of the greatest letter writers of his time. Right. Uh, but Lovecraft found his niche in a New England writer of weird fiction as a general man of letters. He nurtured the careers of many young writers, uh, August Dereleth, Donald Wandrill, uh, Robert Bloch, and Fritz Lieber. He became concerned with political and economic issues as the Great Depression led him to support Roosevelt and become a moderate socialist, mm-hmm. which I think is kind of interesting. So that's kind of the period where he, I mean, obviously he went from like Hitler's great and all this other shit and, to... Uh, I, I know, you know for a fact that Robert Block actually wrote Psycho. Yes, that was the one that I recognized the name of. I didn't recognize the other names, but I knew that that guy. So that's cool. Which was, of course, adapted into a great film by Alfred Hitchcock. So that's pretty neat. So you can trace the lineage of the film Psycho kind of to, to Lovecraft. But, I mean, he touched on so much in the horror movie genre, not obviously not just through his, his active fiction, but through his uh, apprenticeships of people and, you know, kind of taking other writers under his wing and... Uh, corresponding with, uh, you know, the the notable names of you know, on this weird sort of fiction scene. And a lot of people day. have respect for him because based on, you know, a lot of people, these people in this community, like, it's kind of like how, you know, you are. A lot of people look up to you. I mean, even though now you're a miserable failure and everything. Right, yeah, yeah. But it's kind of like that, you know, it's like, you know, man, TJ, but, you 2011 know, that's TJ was fucking great, dude. That's but another you know what? thing. <laughs> 2011 <laughs> TJ, man. Yeah, you remember you know. that guy? But, you know, that, that's the cool thing about... Well, he was great then. I mean, it's kind of awesome to just have something like that to lean back on 
where people are just like, man, I love your old videos. It's like, <laughs> yeah, all right, well, they great. well, you know, whatever. That's true. It's not like I, I don't have to go make them again. I could just be like, yeah, coast on the past. Coast on the past. <laughs> coast on the past. Don't got to put no effort in anymore. Coasting on the past is a blast. All right, so... so uh, the, but the end is the nigh, end is right, nigh, Scotty? dude. The end is nigh for yeah. poor Howard Phillips Lovecraft. It was not destined to live a long life. The last yeah. two or three years of his life, however, were filled with hardship. In 1932, his beloved aunt, Miss Clark, died. Shit. And he moved into quarters at 66 College Street, right behind uh, the John Hay Library, with his other aunt, Miss Gamble. Oh, Gamble. Gamble. Sorry. Well. Sorry. In 1933. So, like, like Stupid I said, bouncing fuck. around. Can't pronounce nothing. Bounce, bouncing around from aunt to aunt. <laughs> um, is there? Are they implying that he was? You know, um, actually, you know what I mean. Most of the stuff I read, uh, you know what I mean, no, Scotty. You know what I mean, no, Scotty. Really, he was not a very like sexy he, uh, active person. He wasn't dipping the uh, wasn't yeah, dipping um, the, dipping his. Uh, they actually hooking up with them old ants. Uh, yeah, actually, H.P. Lovecraft, if I recall correctly, was like a pretty. Like kind of asexual. asexual. Yeah, almost kind of an asexual. Type like he really guy. didn't have much interest in romance. Huh. This is actually the weird tales that features the Call of Cthulhu, and oh, unfortunately, wow. unfortunately, they went with the Ghost Table by Elliot O'Donnell. Yeah, that because that's <laughs> the one that that's the one you lead with, right? That's the one that's gonna go. Someone read through all the stuff they got. It's like, okay, so what should we give the cover art to? You know what I'm thinking? The Ghost Table. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, wait. So you have a story. About a giant tentacle faced sea demon that bends all reality, and instead you're like Ghost Table. Ghost, ghost table. table. The Ghost Table for sure. By Elliot O'Donnell, who everyone fucking totes remembers. Stay back, you fiend, he said, as he pointed his pistol at the <laughs> hideous abomination <laughs> table waddling towards him. Oh, you know what it Sophia reminds me of? As she fainted away from sheer <laughs> disgust. You know what it fucking reminds me of? His deathbed. Oh, fuck. <laughs> he fired a round, and the great beast seemed to be stopped by it for a moment, only to continue advancing. <laughs> Do not want to read Ghost Damn Table. Damn you, Ghost Table! The Ghost Table comes, <laughs> said the servant, as he rang the bell. Dude, maybe Ghost Tale is actually Hold on, let's better. see if I can fucking find a copy of the Ghost Tale. Yeah, we gotta table. read some I of the Ghost Tale. I wanna hear what was better than The Call of Cthulhu, dude. All right, so Elliot O'Donnell uh, was an author known primarily for his books about ghosts. He claimed to have seen a ghost. Of course. Blah, 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 blah. So I guess, that th- I guess this guy was somewhat notable. So that's probably why he got the cover. Probably so. Because uh, I guess he was known as like a ghost story weaver. Um,. Um, look, it looks like now mostly he's known. This this story is known for being on the cover of the book that first right. published Cthulhu. It is so great. That's what his legacy is. Well, I I think I think that's pretty much what I, I gave you the whole plot right there. The table comes to life. A woman faints. A dude shoots it with a gun. It goes <laughs> yeah. away. Well, you're goes just away. you're just describing what's shown in the picture. Which <laughs> by the way. These pictures are notoriously not great at summarizing what actually happens uh, no, in the comic book story. That's just that's just what salty authors say. These these <laughs> the pictures are actually notoriously great at encapsulating everything that a story has to tell. Oh, okay. It's just the salty authors that want to pretend yeah, that there's a deeper meaning to a fucking tiger up, table coming which, to life. Which it was just interesting because I looked this up. I was like, okay, I'm expecting to see Cthulhu is obviously they're going to lead with that, and it's like, nope, it's Ghost Table. I'm like, all right, well, we'll, we'll pull it up anyway, so people can see that. Obviously, history judged it much better than Gross the editors table. of the time. Oh, it's a ghost table coming for you. Uh, so his and stories basically became increasingly lengthy and complex. Uh, Weird tales and other magazines where he published them before. They weren't buying anymore. They they were rejecting his stories. They're like, no, nah, this isn't what people want. Dude, this kind of looks like the Ghostbusters this running away the from Ghostbusters. the mountains of madness. This is actually what this is. Yeah, yeah. I like this story. This so, story, they go to Antarctica and discover that there's like an ancient race of beings. Yes. That uh, came to Earth a long time ago and like created mankind. And now they've created these like guardians of their ancient temple that have gone insane. And are like coming after the world or whatever, and these two dudes discover it in a, a, like an ancient city in Antarctica. It's pretty cool. cool. So, but at this point, he's writing stories that are not getting published because they're too complicated. Well, they're too lengthy, and they're kind of he's kind of out of fashion at this point. He's not really writing the shit that people really want to read. So, basically, or according to the editors of these publications, well, which I'm assuming they would know. 
Because well, they're the ones that... doing the publications. But, of course, their names are not the ones that are famous, iconic right. ho- names in horror. So maybe they don't know. Uh, so basically at this point, he actually resorted to ghostwriting of oh, stories, wow. poetry, and nonfiction. So he works. started submitting his works under, like, bullshit names just to fucking get people to read them. Uh, well, no, like he would actually like uh, ghostwriting. Like he basically he would be write, so he would write for else. other people. He would write right. for other people. Yes. Right. I gotcha. Uh, it is likely that as he saw a death approaching, Lovecraft envisioned the ultimate oblivion of his work. Uh, he had never pu- uh, had a true book published in his lifetime, uh, aside from perhaps the crudely uh, issued "The Shadow of Rin's Mouth" in 1936, and his stories, essays, and poems were scattered in a bewildering number of amateur or pulp magazines. So he's right. like, I don't really have like a compendium. I don't have like a volume that people can just you know. Like today, we have plenty of that. We can just go like, "Hey, H.P. Lovecraft's complete works." Like we're giving away. Like, right, we're giving right. it away as a his shit was now. just in a bunch of fucking magazines that how many people had really read. We but it was really scattered know. all over the fucking place at the time, you know. Yeah, but uh, the friendships that he had forged merely by correspondence held him in good stead. August Derleth and Donald Wandry were determined to preserve Lovecraft's stories in the dignity of a hardcover book and formed the publishing firm Arkham House. Wow. Arkham House. <laughs> I mean, so, that became a big... That's a, it did, that's yeah. To this day, that's a publishing company, so... Yep. Also, the inspiration for things like Batman, you know, Arkham right, Asylum yeah. and stuff like that. Uh, to publish Lovecraft's work, they issued The Outsiders and Others in 1939, and many other volumes followed from Arkham House. Right. So they basically... Uh, so basically, a lot of... That kind of... Uh, his correspondence kind of went in his favor there because he'd been so influential in enough people's lives where when he died, they're like, okay, we can't let this... This guy's talent just fucking fade away. So really, it, it might have been uh, his. his it might have been his aggressive letter writing more than anything that preserved his legacy. Yeah, and, and it actually networking. was. And I mean, because a lot of that stuff wouldn't exist. I mean, because look, I mean, look at this. This is like some. I mean, it's astonishing to think that people would even have this today. Like I mean, only a handful of these probably still exist in the world. And just for take one story out of this that's been serialized and just say, hey, this this guy's works were. What does that say? Uh, February nineteen thirty six on the top. I believe it does. Uh, let's see if I can f- buy a copy. Astounding Stories, uh, February 1936. If I can fucking see if there's a... Astounding Stories, February 1936. Um, four volumes of Astounding... Yeah, remember, these are published, too, on very cheap paper. Right. So, right, I mean, they were pulp novels. Yeah, yeah like literally pulp, pulp magazines. Yeah, that's why they were called pulp. Right. Yeah, so They're it's like... like the cheapest shit that you could put out. You could buy four volumes of this, including this edition, for about uh, $1,600. There you go. Damn. So this alone, I'd imagine... I don't know what the price of this one by itself would be. I can't find that, but I could see it in a... So it's about $400 per issue. Compilation. Here, you can... I'll just put it up on the screen so you guys can see. This yeah. is uh, from abebooks.com. Four volumes of astounding stories from February, March, April, and June of 1936. So that's going about four sixteen hundred bucks. I mean, that's really the price of the one magazine with the yeah the Lovecraft. Story, I mean, probably that would be awesome to own that one though. Oh yeah, it's cool. I mean, it'd definitely be neat. I don't I mean, know if I, yeah, that cool kind of money one, though. I don't know about that. I like these old uh, um, art, but yeah, styles. you're probably right about that because there are some like uh, ones from around that era that don't have H.P. Lovecraft in them that you could get for like thirty five bucks. Right. Yeah. Well, so. those are, that, those are different. I kind of like these, dude. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure you, you could probably read some pretty cool stories. And a lot of times, sci-fi, a lot of people don't think it ages well, but I think it does because uh, it just it just gets a, a, a patina of cheese over the years. Yeah. It didn't really happen too much to Lovecraft's work, though. Like, there is, you know what? I mean, no, it's there. It has. It, 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 it has. There, it are has. Love, there are fucking Cthulhu plushy dolls yeah, now. It has. No, no, but I'm, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about the original text, though. Well, I mean, isn't that what happens to it, though? He's well, no, I'm saying that, like... Normalized? Well, m- maybe. I mean, I'm, I'm not talking... But I'm not talking about the culture around it changing and embracing and doing things. I'm talking about the texts themselves in light of modernity, basically. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about, then. I'm just saying, like, erase all the fucking bullshit that society has done to react to the story. Because, like, like you said, you, you read some of these stories... Most of the shit in, in these uh, old astounding stories and weird tales and shit is not famous. No, it's not. But if it you sucks. read it, but if you read it now, I mean, it doesn't necessarily suck. But if you read it now, like some of the fucking ideas in like science and the sensibilities and all that stuff just feels like totally weird and foreign now because well, it's all depreciated. Totally you have a different understanding of reality than someone did in fucking oh, well, nineteen thirty six. Yeah, yeah, you're saying like. But yeah. what I'm saying is that Lovecraft's work probably because of the detached nature of them 
and how he wrote ab- mostly about things that never existed and you know seems so far beyond human understanding in the first place. They kind of maintain that air of fucking mystery. Well, this was super niche too. This wasn't like I mean, yeah, people want to represent like I'm not saying no one read these, but this wasn't like everyone was reading these kind of stories. No, I mean this is like yeah, a, these were the nerds of the day. Yeah, those are the right. nerds. We're picking these up. The horror, the horror geeks. I don't and know. The yeah, comic book nerds. and it's kind of hard to explain to people because now uh, so many people are kind of. Embracing this, this kind of yeah. nerd stuff that nerd culture is bigger than other uh, ever, but it, so it's kind of hard to rem- remember now the time when it's like a nerd was a nerd, and that was you know it wasn't right. everybody. You're it was a nerd into for superheroes a and lasers and all that stuff. Yeah, when I, even when I, we were growing up, it was not fucking cool. To like that, you were like that shit's fucking lame. You read Cobb, that's lame. Football and NASCAR or whatever the fuck nonsense. The people who thought video games and shit were lame then. It was yeah. not like mainstream. It was like, that was like, oh, you're a loser. Inside, play play video, video games. Games. You're, you're a fucking video games. You're fucking faggot. You know? But uh, now everyone's into that shit, so, so whatever. We're going to get this. Uh, it's Al Capone. It's not Al Capone. <laughs> no. <laughs> we'll talk about uh, Lovecraft and Robert Howard here. But uh, in 1936, the suicide of Robert Howard, one of his closest correspondents. And this is Robert Howard here. Yeah. Left him confused and saddened. Uh, by this time, the illness would uh, cause his own death. Cancer of the intestine had already progressed so far mm. that little could be done to treat it. Lovecraft attempted to carry on in increasing pain, and through the winter of 1936 and 7, was finally compelled to enter the Jane Brown Memorial Hospital on March 10, 1937, where he died five days later. He was buried on March 18th at the Phillips family plot at Swan Point Cemetery. Sounds like he had a long, slow, miserable death. Yep. Sounds yep. like Robert E. Howard actually had a had the better idea there. And I didn't really get into Robert uh, E. Howard's suicide, but it was actually because his mother had lived with tuberculosis for a number of years, mm-hmm. uh, and on finding it, she was she was uh, at some point this near the end of very end, end of her life, she was uh, slipped into a coma, and became unconscious, and he asked a nurse, he said, "Will my mother recover or regain consciousness?" And I said, "No." And he walked outside, uh, put a revolver to his head, and pulled the trigger. Well, he didn't he didn't just walk outside the hospital? He actually walked until he was quite. Uh, far out in the woods. Well, I actually, I, I did not read that. That's how he did it. I read well, that he, he went outside and shot himself. And his, his my understanding is, uh, is uh, uh, basically his father and, you know, and a doctor tried to help him. Right. Everything. I've, my understanding of how Robert E. Howard died, and maybe maybe it's just myth, because you know a lot of stuff from the past does get mythologized. But I always heard that he wandered deep into the woods and blew his brains no, out in the woods. No, because they were able to, they were able to on hand to treat him like oh, okay. very shortly after. Well, from I'm, what I read. Well, I read wrong then, man. I, I mean, was lied to yeah, again. I don't remember reading that in the research I did. I read fabrications kind of, and lies, TJ. All well, you know what? I I say I I like the wood story better, so I mean, I'm a lot of people that. said he did it because he was gay, too. I've heard that as well. You know, <laughs> well, um I will tell you another story I heard which apparently could just be just as fucking bullshit or it could just be him trying to build up the character, but he he did used to say that when he was writing a Conan story, he felt like Conan the Barbarian was behind him, and that if he stopped writing, he would be killed by Conan. Like that's how he felt like Conan was like literally standing well, over his shoulder. One thing about Howard's work making is that, him write is that he is someone that's very like and he was way more prolific than Lovecraft. Oh, he was, but I'm, but also he was very into his work. Like he like imagined himself being in right. his tales. Like that's like how serious. Like, like you said, that story. I mean. Yeah, he was Kinda totally immersed. With his, um, who he is as a person. So yeah. this is someone that really helped shape a lot of uh, Lovecraft's writing. And uh, I would say, like, you know, when he died, it was kind of the only person that was really mentioned, like, strongly. Like, he was really like, what the fuck, dude? I was like, and, and, and like I said, there's actually a book of their letters that's been annotated. And you can actually, oh, fuck, I can't remember the name of it, but you I'll can find it. Up. You can find it. Uh, it's like 60 bucks or some 40 bucks online, but it's like over a thousand pages of letters and correspondence. And uh, most of H.P. Lovecraft's responses or letters have not survived. So a lot of it has to be contextualized from uh, Robert E. Howard's letters. But they, I've heard of a lot of people say that it's kind of interesting if you're interested in these two guys and their mythos and more about them and kind of get an insight between two authors. Uh, it looks like it's called A Means to Freedom. I think that's what it is. Um, is that it? I'm trying to figure it out. It's like the letters of that, that. That's it. A means to freedom. Yeah. And there's a it's like a there looks like there's a few different little collections here. And you said it's mostly uh, Howard. It's mostly uh, Robert E. Howard's letters. Yes. So Lovecraft was better at preserving them, I guess, than uh, than Howard was. Or, or maybe they threw him away after he died or something. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not really sure. But more, more, more I think about 75 percent are Howard's letters. Wow. From my understanding of. Uh, cool. I tried to find the the books online. I was not able to. Well, some I mean, like uh, a lot of times with books, it's, you know, 
they're hard to find. Like the, they go out of print, and then everyone forgets about them, and <laughs> then years later you hear about them existing, and you're like, "Fuck, I wish that was still in print." I know, right? So uh, in August 1930, Howard wrote a letter into Weird Tales praising a recent reprint of H.P. Lovecraft's *The Rats in the Walls*, discussing some of the obscure Gaelic references used within. Uh, Wright, who was the editor, uh, forwarded the letter to Lovecraft, who responded warmly to Howard, and the tune, and the soon uh, the two Weird Tales veterans engaged in a vigorous correspondence that would last for the rest of Howard's life. Cool. Uh, by virtue of this, Howard quickly became a member of the, quote, Lovecraft Circle, a group of writers and friends all linked via the immense correspondence of H.P. Lovecraft, who made it a point to introduce his many like-minded friends to each other and encourage them to share stories, utilize each other's invented fictional trappings, and help each other succeed in pulp, the pulp field. Wow. So he was, a, I mean, he was like a major sort of like, uh, I mean, like once again, the strength of his networking. He, you know? he, he wanted this to proliferate. He wanted them to help. Not only did he try to make the connections, but he tried to share the connections with each other and tried to make sure that he was providing resources for people and their stories. And, you know, um, if he saw two people that should have been conversing with each other and sharing ideas, he tried to make it happen. Uh, so a facilitator as well as a networker and a provider of resources to write. I mean, like, you know, uh, they don't have the Internet they can go to 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 look up a resource or anything. You know, no, these, these people have to, you know, you know, and, you know, they're not it's not like there's a big writer complex. You know, they got a fucking they're, they're scattered all over the country. Yeah. So they got to write letters to each other. And yeah. really, he, he got H.P. Lovecraft's attention because he mentioned some obscure part of the story that was like kind of just like a nerd thing, like, oh, this Gaelic thing that you use, la, da, da. So it's like they really struggled with conversation. And based on that, just kind of like liking that reference to the story and like, you know, acknowledging like, hey, this is kind of something like off the wall. That's just a little detail that just kind of like, you know, gives the story a little bit more background. It fleshes it out more. And just I think just that attention to detail. And they're mm-hmm. kind of they kind of had similar personalities in that, I guess, that respect of storytelling. Yeah. Uh, so how was given the affectionate name Two gun Bob by virtue of his long explanations to Lovecraft about the history of his beloved Southwest? Uh, and during the ensuing years, he contributed several notable elements of Love's, uh, to Lovecraft's uh, Cthulhu mythos of horror stories. The correspondence between Howard and Lovecraft contained a lengthy discussion on frequent element in Howard's fiction, uh, barbarism versus civilization. Howard held that civilization was inherently corrupt and fragile. Uh, the attitude is summed up in his famous line from Beyond the Black River. Barbarism is the natural state of mankind. Civilization is unnatural is a whim of circumstance, and barbarism must always ultimately triumph. Lovecraft held the opposite viewpoint. The civilization was the peak of human achievement and the only way forward. Howard countered by listing many historical abuses of the citizenry by various so-called civilized leaders. Howard initially deferred to Lovecraft, but uh, gradually asserted his own views, uh, even at kind of a time as becoming to start to deride his position. So at first it was kind of like a very respectful, like, yeah, I see where you're coming from to, like, they're actually going at it in these letters. They're going back and forth. They're arguing. They're actually passionately defending their positions instead of yeah. him just kind of being like his You're a boy. fucking retard. No, you a fucking retard. <laughs> I love it. Well, hey, man, that's, that's kind of how shit it's like. You know, he was respectful at first because he kind of, like, obviously admired H.P. Lovecraft, and then it was kind of, like, more just like, hey, we're more like equals now. You know what, H.P.? I used to like you. I used to like you, HP, but this kooky shit you're talking about civilization, I just can't fucking take it no more, man. You're a piece of shit, That's HP. how Robert yeah. Howard talked. And this guy yeah, was, this that's guy how I got... talk, TJ. You got a fucking problem with it, TJ Kirk? I guess not. You got a fucking problem with it, TJ Kirk? No, I don't. Because well, I got like... two answers to your problem, one on each hip, okay? Pearl handled. You want to see them? Twin sisters. <laughs> Little Mary Firebrand and... Little Josie Ju- Junebug. Jew. I'll pull him. Whoa, dude. Little I'll pull Josie him. Jew. I'll pull him out and introduce you, but they're loud. I don't I know how he you. sounded, but I know he lived in Texas at the time and for most of his life. So, so what? So what? I still sound like this. Sounds like Tony from New York. Generic fucking old <laughs> fucking gangster talk. Oh. Uh, so I pulled this quote oh. from... Uh, oh. 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 From Robert e. Howard, TJ. I think, I think you should read it, dude. Uh, I hate his school. This is Robert E. Howard talking. I hated school as I hate the memory of school. It wasn't the work I minded. I had no trouble learning the tripe they dished out in the way of lessons, except arithmetic. And I might have learned that if I'd gone through the trouble of studying it. I wasn't at the head of my class except in history, but I wasn't at the foot either. I generally did just enough work to keep from flunking the courses. And I don't regret the loafing I did. 
But what I hated was the confinement, the clock-like regularity of everything, the regulation of my speech and actions. Most of all, the idea that someone considered himself or herself an authority over me with the right to question my acts and actions and interfere with my thoughts. I think that pretty much sums up you in school, TJ. Well, no, because I didn't even I didn't even do it. I know, but I'm by, saying but that, but that the, the attitude he's he's copping atti- an attitude that I, attitude. I can recognize. Well, that's what I wanted you to. Well, which, that's pretty much how I, I think you felt in school. Like, why are these motherfuckers have any authority? So over wait, me? am I Robert E. Howard or am I H. P. Lovecraft? I don't know. You're kind of both, dude. Maybe you're I'm the Robert E. Lovecraft. All right, I can do it. You just didn't read it in the Brooklyn accent, TJ. I'm sorry. I the only thing that was missing. I should have read that Texans fucking account in yep. a. What the fuck is going on here? My tongue is fucking fucked up, dude. I can't. I got like something on the fucking side of my tongue that hurts when I talk. So fuck you guys. What, you bit your tongue? I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I think my tongue has fucking been stabbed by a fucking evil fork or something. Damn, dude. Oh, dude. That's weird. Maybe I mean, that cat crawled in there while you were sleeping and yeah. ate part of your tongue. Maybe so. I ate your tongue, DJ. I eat your Cornelius tongue. the bush cat ate your tongue. Who the fuck are these people? Uh, this is a picture of Robbie Tower. I think it's him on the right. I oh, believe. okay. Oh, they're cosplaying. Cool. Yeah. So they're definitely the dorks of Old the school LARPin. Uh, here's uh, one of Howard's books Conan the Conqueror. Roar! Howard's only book length novel, worthy to stand beside such heroic fantasy as E.R. Edison and J.R.R. Tolkien. Hmm. <laughs> A lot of these fantasy writers seem to like these initial names. They do. Oh, they yeah, it's a definite like trope in the fantasy world for sure. It, you don't really see it in others, but like fantasy writers in particular. So what we were talking yeah. about before this, TJ, is where's the <laughs> mythos? The mythos of <laughs> Oh, no. Yes. There's no way to say it right. You can't, just don't you even can't try. say it. You just can't don't say even it. fucking try. That's him. That's our buddy, right? So this is basically a quote. About the uh, about H.P. Lovecraft to the uh, actually the editor Farnsworth, Farnsworth, right, the editor of uh, Weird Tales pulp magazine. Now all of my tales are based on fundamental premise that common human laws and interests or emotions have no validity or significance in the vast cosmos at large. Agree. To me, there is nothing but purity in a tale which the human which the human form and the local human passions and conditions and standards are depicted as native to other worlds or other universes. To achieve the essence of real externality, whether of time or space or dimension, one must forget such, that such things as organic life, good and evil, love and hate, and all such local attributes of neg- negligible and temporary race called mankind have any existence at all. Only the human scenes and characters must have human qualities. These must be handled with unsparing realism, not catchpenny romanticism, but when we cross the line to the boundless and hideous unknown, the shadow haunt outside, we must remember to leave our humanity and terrestrialism at the threshold. That's H.P. Lovecraft, 1927. He's like, fuck your human shit, bitch. Just like, look, unless we're dealing with human characters, then yeah, sure, let's just try to be as realistic with them as possible. Besides that, this is fantastical. And, uh, you know, even... I will say that even uh, he says he doesn't use the catchpenny romanticism when he's writing human characters, but he really doesn't use much... Humanity when he's writing human characters. Yeah, the unsparing. It's realism. not really his strength mm. as a writer. Um, I don't really think his human his depictions of humans tend to be realistic. Mm. They're there kind of like when I read Lovecraft, they're there kind of like a psychic uh, analog for me. They're 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 the base amount of character that needs to exist for me to then experience the horror of what they see or find out right. through their eyes and mind. So he. I think he kind of, maybe it's a choice or maybe it's just an artifact of his writing style, but he really isn't known for creating memorable human characters. No, not at all. Um, the memorable things that he created were the things that those human characters witnessed. This type, you know, I don't know that this actually happens in any of his Yeah, books. a lot of them bear witness, you know, to these crazy events. They're, or or are touched by it in some yes. way. Or are caught up in the worship of it. Um, you yeah. know, so they're all there as just kind of vessels to experience the unexperienceable. Yeah. You know, to invite you to pr- put yourself in their shoes. Right. And, uh, you know, um, one of the things that Lovecraft, uh, I mean, Stephen King in particular, has derided Lovecraft for his very clunky, wordiness, terrible uh, dialogue. His dialogue. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, there is a, 
it's one of the few. Remember how I was earlier saying that uh, Lovecraft didn't suffer too much from the cheesiness thing. There is a, a farmer in uh, the color out of space. Oh God, dude! Who uh, <laughs> Lovecraft trying to write a farmer is about the cheesiest oh, most. God. I R B a country bucket. <laughs> yes, it was like how it you. was like it comes from some place where things ain't as they is here. You know, it's like just totally really out of it. it was totally out of his fucking element writing bad. that character because he because uh, he conceptualized the rest of the story clearly, but that part was just like, well, I need to have some rube witness the event. And I think he knew it because there is very little dialogue in Lovecraft stories. It tends to be first person narration. Yep. Uh, of a very clinical and detached sort of... Uh, very, like, uh, you know, wordy, nature. too. Yes. Very, like, 50-cent college word. So all very uh, highly educated people, highly, or at least voc- uh, vocabulary-wise, yes. uh, gifted. Lovecraft was definitely um, obsessed with showing you just how uh, intelligent he was in every story. I always sure. liked... There are some people that complain about that because it can add, like, a, a, a slowness to reading his stories and truly understanding them because I had to fucking... You know, the first time I sat down and read Lovecraft, I had to get a thesaurus out. <laughs> yeah, um, You know what I mean? And find I've, out what's, like, 90% you definitely, of the shit there are There are occasions, and a lot of times I'll just let it be... I'll just figure it out by context, but there are definitely times... Yeah. I mean, it, it, it'd be pretty strange to read a Lovecraft story and not need to consult something. Because not only was he wordy as fuck, but he was wordy as fuck by 1930 standards. When right. There was but that, that, there's that, words in use then that are not even yeah, depreciated. People words. don't even use yeah, them now. Doesn't that just serve his attempt to paint these things in a light that's inscrutable to people? Right. And I think it also uh, it also just helps with the sort of clinical detachment that he writes about these. Th- that's one of the cool things about Lovecraft is he writes about these extraordinary things, but through a very clinical scientific detached eye you right. know he's not trying to bolt, but it, but it, but it's you know. but it's futile though because he he's he's writing these incredibly intelligent people trying to contextualize what he himself has set up as uncontextualizable right. yeah the incomprehensible right yes. and yeah. so it's a you know that's the kind of game of a lovecraft story and um i think that's why they're popular if you want to oh yeah you know narrow it down we're actually going to discuss they're it's sponges not only the characters sponges to experience this stuff but the stuff itself like this, this isn't, you know, Lovecraft didn't draw this or dictate this. This is somebody's conceptualization of Cthulhu from reading, right. uh, 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 you know, what Cthulhu Lovecraft awakens. wrote. So it's, um, you know, it's it's pretty awesome that these works, you know, were able to soak up so much creative talent and so much of the imaginations of people that have read them. Oh, yeah. And engage I mean, that. In and people. to this day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that's powerful to think, you know, 70, 80 years later, people are still driving. People love, to, people love the opportunity to use their imaginations because we're given so little opportunity, especially these days. Like, when was the last time you were really, like, asked to, like, hey, man, use your imagination and just, like, fill in some of the blanks in this crazy world? And no, yeah. Everything I mean, people just, still do it, but uh, well, everything's just served to you now. I know people still do it. I know it's still out there. We're I'm not saying, invited to do it. Very most people often, are, are content consumers, not creators, for right. sure. And I mean, most stories. And a lot of the reason why too is that a lot of people attempt these kind of stories and have this significant. I'm work, not even but, talking about attempting the stories. I'm talking about reading a story that invites you to use your imagination, or even watching up. a movie or anything, right? You know. you know that that really invokes that old imaginative quality of like, hey, this is an empty vessel for me to fill with all oh. the things. I fear. No, mo- I mean, modern cinema definitely does not do that. Everything, I mean, every, every, everything has to be explained to you. Everything has to be wrapped up nicely. It's like these stories don't ha- don't follow that narrative structure. Where it's like, okay, so they're going to defeat Cthulhu. They're going to fucking kill him. They're going to stop no. his. Pr- they're going to you know. It's just, no. They, they're witnesses to the history, basically. Right, right. Not and then barely that because they're driven completely mad by the experience, and who knows if they're credible witnesses? Oh, you not know? at all. Uh, so before we get into this, today, I just wanted to read uh, briefly okay, too. Sure about the uh, Cthulhu mythos. Yes, right. Some people might not be aware of it. It is a shared fictional universe originating from the works of American horror writer H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, the turn was actually coined by August Derleth, a contemporary correspondent and protege of Lovecraft. We actually mentioned him earlier. Yeah, I remember. Uh, to identify the settings, tropes, and lore that were employed by Lovecraft and his literary successors because actually, he's actually considered the first stage right. of the Cthulhu mythos. August Derleth is actually considered the second stage. Uh, the name Cthulhu derives from, I would say, the Call of Cthulhu. We already know that. Uh, so this is his most famous works. Yeah. 
Cthulhu. I mean, even people who are not even vaguely familiar with Lovecraft beyond Cthulhu. Everyone's heard of Cthulhu, Cthulhu, pretty much. Yes. I mean, it was on he's South on Park. Fucking, yeah, he's been on fucking South Park. Fuck. Kill so. Justin Bieber. Yeah, <laughs> which was that was awesome. His proudest moment. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, um, that's pretty cool. I mean, I mean, people are obviously still writing works that take place in that mythos to this day and shit. You so. know what? Nobody's ever tackled it head on though. No, like movie wise or major fiction wise. Um, yeah, there was a movie uh, adaptation of the Call of Cthulhu way back in the day that I'm to understand. And there's a mo- there's a Dagon movie yeah, as Dagon. well. I but I just feel like it's never been given this treatment on the silver screen. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it's kind of strange with as shit. iconic as the character is, and as much as Hollywood is out of ideas that they haven't been like, let's do a fucking high budget Cthulhu movie. Yeah, maybe it's just because they don't get it. You know, we're actually <laughs> later on going to look at uh, some works inspired by H.P. Lovecraft. And there's cool. a ton. I sp- I th- that's why I just linked you to the Wikipedia article on it. I was like, dude, I haven't. <laughs> it is a massive number. I don't see a Wikipedia article here, but uh, if you look at the document, you can find it. But uh, it if you pull there. up the um, the, article, the top ten uh, stories of H.P. Lovecraft. Yeah. Scroll down, TJ. Okay. Because I. Dagon. 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 Diagon, fucking Diagon. <laughs> so that's just, uh, I have read this story. It actually is pretty short. I think it's like six pages. Yeah, or it's not a very long one. It's not a long. Yeah, I think this one. is actually the first one I ever read because I the first I I heard about Lovecraft. I think I heard about Lovecraft for the first time reading um, Dance Macabre by Stephen King, uh, or you could say Macabre if you want. Um, I read that, and then uh, he talked extensively about Lovecraft in that, and I'd kind of maybe heard. Lovecraft's name tossed around, but I hadn't really looked into it. Uh, but after Stephen King talked about him, I was like, okay, I'm going to check this guy out. And I went and bought a little anthology of Lovecraft stories. And this was the first one in it. And it was the first one I read. And um, I was, uh, I think I was still kind of trying to adjust to the the style of his writing and shit. So I don't remember. Oh, I, I remember um, a dude in a boat in a dried up ocean looking at some strange artifacts and shit and there being some kind of maybe like tribe that's or like a fish people yeah, in yeah it and they're worshiping eventually. they're worshiping some kind of crazy fish god called dagon right um i don't think you actually see dagon in the story maybe no. you do but um i think it just kind of like centers around these these worshipers but like uh, paul the uh, point that paul brought up says so we hear the story centers around the written account perhaps ramblings of an unnamed man of a seafaring background now heavily addicted to the drug morphine so like you said this is basically a raving lunatic telling you about what what done happened to him out on the seas. Right. So right. and and that that's always the case. Well, not always, maybe, well, but not, it's always not it's always. the case in a lot of the stories that I've read of of his. Yeah, is he that gives you non credible witnesses. Right. These witnesses the are not credible. So so you it's another part of his existential horror is that maybe this all happened in this person's fevered mind. You know. Wow. Yeah. Or maybe there's some connection. Maybe maybe their their insanity allows them to see something that we can't. Yeah, but basically, you pretty much sum the story up. He just yeah, gets to a uh, thing, a sit, like he walks forever on like this, a basically a dried out sea, and he yeah, comes to the yeah. city and sees the idols. And I don't remember everything about it. I remember it was kind of just like it kind of just seemed like a little snapshot almost. Like there wasn't really much of a story. It was just like open ended. Some guy like telling you like I had this really weird experience where this crazy fucking shit happened to me, right. and you don't really trust him, or maybe you do. Uh, but you know he's presented in a way where it's like you don't know if this is actually how it happened or what. Uh, I mean, you know, it's left open, and I think that you know it's once again Lovecraft using like uncertainty as a fucking element. You know, um, the outsider. This one, um, this is kind of Lovecraft's attempt, in my understanding, to be like his uh, his childhood hero, um, uh, uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah. Unhappy is he to whom the memories of childhood bring only fear and sadness. Yeah. So, H.P. Lovecraft. <laughs> uh, I think that this was um, adapted kind of loosely into a movie called Castle Freak. That was it? uh, It's not super similar <laughs> in every not. regard, but... <laughs> but it was kind of inspired by it. But anyway, the reason he wrote... He actually wrote this book. Um, if you look at the way he wrote it... Um, he uses way more flowery prose than he normally uses in his stories, and the reason is, is he was trying to imitate and pay tribute to uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Oh, okay. So uh, this one is really wordy and like super purple and ultra descriptive, almost like Anne Rice-ish 
in its over the top vivid descriptions of everything, which I I like <clears throat> when it's done well. Oh uh, well, obviously, Lovecraft I've read the Dunwich Horror, which guy. I don't know is that a part of this. Uh, this is just one story. Um, okay, so I haven't I haven't read the Outsiders. And it basically, yeah, neither have I. It can well the Outsiders kind of about. Um, and once again, it's not really much of a plot. There's not like a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's I'm just, used to that. It just kind of concerns this guy that uh, lives in this this old castle, and uh, he thinks that he's just a guy. He thinks he's just a dude living in a castle. He doesn't realize that he's this horrible monster that's uh, unlike uh, a human being in, right. in many ways. So it's basically like a. Um, you know, he doesn't really realize it's it's about a monster who doesn't realize he's a monster kind of living in this horrible old castle. Okay. And uh, you know, it just kind of paints a little portrait of of him and I don't really remember if he actually does anything in the story, but I do remember the writing being really So it's kind of a sympa- fleshed out and over the top and purple. So it's kind of like a sympathetic to the monster kind of story. Yeah. That's kind of cool. I think the Dunwich Horror, which is the next one on our list, is probably his most like character driven of the stories that I've read. It, it centers around a different kind of protagonist. And this one I have not read. Somebody that's not really from normal society, but kind of like as an outcast and a freak. And um, he's born to like this crazy uh, albino mom who's into this occult shit. And it's intoned that his father is actually the Lovecraftian god uh, Yog sothoth or Yogs. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's Yog sothoth uh- yeah, I believe that's right. Or Yog Satoth, or however you say it. Um, he's, uh, and it, it, this is actually the story he's introduced in. Mm-hmm. So the son, he's kind of a freak himself, looks kind of disgusting. All the people in uh, town hate to look at him and hate him around. So he goes looking for information about his father. He tries to find the Necronomicon. That's pretty awesome. Um, he finds it and is killed by what is summoned when he reads it. And then two, and, and then some fucking thing starts haunting his house and two investigators come to kill it. Um, it's a, it's an interesting, like uh, it, it, it's different from some of the other short stories that we've covered. Yeah. In my opinion, because it's got a it's got a definite arc to it where and and it feels like something's being introduced with it. You know, it's like, here's Yog sothoth Here's the idea of this uh, part of our our mythos. Mm -hmm. And that was a big debate about uh, H.P. Lovecraft was that a lot of people argue that there was a set kind of sort of pantheon that, you know, maybe never codified. But the the crumbs were left there and people have contextually pieced them together. And a lot of people also argue that, look, this is just kind of a background element. He never really thought it was important enough. That's why he never really categorized or cataloged it like other people have come back and done, obviously, later on. Right. Right. Well, maybe it just I mean, like, I don't know if that was even a thing that was done uh, at that time, like, you know, coming up with a, a universe, like a fictional universe where otherwise well, disparate stories well, are well, set. I don't know if that was like a thing. Whether it was, was intentional or not, it definitely you know, became a thing. I mean, Lovecraft elements definitely have pervaded ever since. Then. Uh, the Color Out of Space, it's kind of like an alien story, isn't it? Like a meteor lands yes. and it's got some kind of monster juice in it or something. It's been a long time since I don't remember I ex- this one. It's coming. That's kind of a common setup for even horror stories to this day, though. The alien the, infestation. The story. meteor lands and there's something bad it, in I it. I don't remember when I read this, it being immediately apparent that I was dealing with an alien infestation, and it took me a while into it before I was like, oh, because it doesn't have the modern conceptualization of what an alien invasion would be like. Right. So it's not immediately, like, I, I thought we were dealing with more, you know... Um, more of his uh, I guess that, uh, weird other god type right. of stuff. Right, and uh, Lovecraft said, he, it says here in this little thing we got that, um, you know, Lovecraft wrote this as a reaction to his disgust at a lot of the written and portrayed aliens from outer space. So I think he was trying, I think he was probably disgusted at how we were anthropomorphizing right. them, if I know Lovecraft. So he was trying to... So he to- was trying to... F- Take that yeah. human element not, away as much not, as possible. It's not a human, basically. Human Which is interesting because you know if you listen to modern pe- you know scientists who study this sort of thing, exobiologists or whatever they're called, people that theorize about what you know life could look like, they're he, he'd be right, more correct. You yeah. Know, this idea that we're going to find another bipedal, two-eyed, two-armed species that you know looks and and acts much like us is pretty silly. And a lot of shows, I mean, like, look, like the Twilight Zone definitely was guilty of that. Star Trek was definitely guilty of that to a large extent. I mean, mean, a lot of that's budgetary. It's budgetary, of course, true. But yeah, but I mean, that's definitely something we see a lot in sci-fi is just totally anthropomorphizing aliens and making them humanoids. It's definitely not the case in this story. 
and it's a weird one. I forget I what even is. I think it was like some kind of weird. Was it some kind of weird spore or something? Yeah, I yeah, yeah. It, it was a spore. Yeah. It was. It was like uh, uh, coming off of the meteor. Kind of similar to that Stephen King story uh, in a creep show. Yeah, uh, uh, that was day the day of the Triffids as yeah. well. The day of the Triffids. You can also kind of compare it to like the Blob and maybe even Killer Clowns from Outer Space. I don't know. Anyway, the Lurking Fear. I've never read that one. Nope. Um, yeah. I don't know about it. Neither do I. Uh, at mountains. At the mountains of madness. Uh, didn't Paul? You were describing that one earlier, weren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, this one's um, about they. Uh, I don't like. I said it's been a long time since I read this stuff, but this one's about researchers. They go to the. Uh, uh, Antarctic wastes. They find some fossils, some crazy fucking, like weird spiral fossil things that don't look like any kind of life on Earth, and that leads them kind of deeper. And they find this temple, this ancient temple built by an ancient race. And they slowly but surely kind of figure out that these aliens came here, seeded the world world with humans, and then kind of disappeared and left behind these guardians to protect their temple. But the guardians have gone insane, and they're these crazy beast multi eyeballed crazy you know cosmic horrors that are rampaging and these guys have to beat them uh the shadow out time another one i have not read it says that this piece involves an alien race known as the yith and their ability to take over or switch with host bodies lovecraft biographer st joshi joshi suggests this came at the viewing of the movie berkeley square and a series of horror stories that implied transfer of consciousness uh, it's so like that's, a <clears throat> pod people kind of thing. Yeah, that sounds kind of interesting. Yeah. The Shadow Over Innsmouth. Now, I feel like I did read that one, but I'm trying to recall what it was. Yeah, I don't remember. Um, through his travels as a, a scholar of genealogy, he encounters the city and its abnormal residents with traits that cause him concern. Later, he learns many nefarious rumors and gains insight from perhaps the only human inhabitant, a town drunk, of course, the, always an unreliable narrator. Yeah, Zadok Allen. Named Zadok Allen. <laughs> I don't think I actually have read that, but um, God, I feel like I did, though. Whatever. Yeah, I feel like I've read Shadow Over Innsmouth. The Whisper in the Darkness. Not read it. Anyone here? No, nope. I have not. And I, I have read The Call yes. of Cthulhu. Yeah, of course. And one of the things that's cool about that is it actually takes place primarily in uh, New Orleans, uh, the parts that aren't set in uh, the sunken another city neat, of Raleigh. Anyway. Another neat tie-in. Yeah. Um, and it, uh, you know, I, I, I can really say that uh, there was a bit of a, there is a, a bit of a New Orleans vibe to the story, and you can kind of see the streets of New Orleans. Um, he's very, he's very good he at describing, it. right? You know, especially like a New Orleans at this time as well. It's right. kind of an interesting read because uh, of that. And uh, you know, I don't know if he'd ever been to the city. He was extensively uh, traveled, apparently. So. I would imagine that if he wrote, you know, this so, this extensively uh, yeah. about New Orleans. But then again, he was, was very scared of uh, of black people. So I, <laughs> so, I actually yeah. pulled some information specifically about this story because this is okay. his most famous work. So. Right, obviously, yeah. Uh, so Cthulhu mythos scholar Robert M. Price claims the irregular sonnet, "The Kraken." Written in 1830 by Alfred Tennyson was a major inspiration for Lovecraft's story, as both a reference, uh, because both reference a huge aquatic creature sleeping for an eternity at the bottom of the ocean, destined to emerge right. from its slumber. And, and I mean, like sea monsters in general had been a the Leviathan a thing, yeah. you know. So it's not like this. Well, is the Kraken is the ultimate, you know, yeah. fucking evil <laughs> antiquity sea monster that's going to destroy the well, world. And Lovecraft was all about the unknown, and even now the deep, deep sea is yeah. unknown to us. So, it's so the, you know, it's the ultimate uh, close to home unknown that's left. Right. For us. I mean, you know, and obviously he was very attracted to monsters coming from space, or uh, and this is a monster that comes from the sea, or it just comes from like the ether of. Some unknown cave or dark realm. So I pulled a very uh, succinct summary of the story. So, man discovers the notes of his late granduncle and is pulled into a conspiracy involving an ancient oceanic god and his violent followers. Uh, the story is considered the launching pad for what became known as the Cthulhu mythos, uh, Lovecraft's overarching horror plot involving the creatures and gods that populated Earth long before humanity came into being. Uh, exploring themes of madness, religious hysteria, and cosmic horror, The Call of Cthulhu is one of Lovecraft's most iconic works. Although it wasn't initially regarded as one of his best works, including by Lovecraft himself, it later gained a champion of Robert E. Howard, we talked about earlier, and has since become one of Lovecraft's most reprinted works. It has been adapted into silent films, radio dramas, and comic book adaptations, as well as being used to inspire countless works, not based directly on the work, but influenced by the Well, you know, movies. Paul, that kind of gets into something we were talking about earlier when we were talking about Margaritaville. Yeah, because you were kind of, we were talking about how the legacy of how that song has, Margaritaville a, has a strangely strong legacy. Um, and yet, uh, you know, 
you were kind of wondering, did Jimmy Buffett know that that was going to be the shit he was remembered for when he wrote it? Well, uh, it says here, Lovecraft, after he wrote uh, The Call of Cthulhu, was just like, meh. Not one of my stronger works, right. but yeah, and it ends it up as, becoming like the cultural phenomenon. Yeah, rather, that, rather middling, not as bad as the worst. Little did he know it was going to be oh, his, sure. the thing that cemented his legacy. What do legacy. you think it is about this one, other than uh, outside of because he, you know, his uh, writings are just filled with horrible beasts and crazy monsters and stuff. What about this monster? Is it? Is it just the profile that he cuts, the tentacle mouth? I think thing? that uh, when you just when you the second you see Cthulhu, you just don't you don't fucking forget about Cthulhu. I mean, like he's got other monsters and other you know other gods and these these uh, I forget what he calls them like the otherworldly beings, that elder he talks gods, about, elder gods and yeah. stuff like that. The like old ones, Nyar Lathotep, and you know Cthanos or whatever the fuck other bullshit. But uh, I don't know, something about Cthulhu, he just cuts a handsome profile. I think he's kind of a confusing creature because he looks kind of aquatic, but he has wings. So it seems like he can be in the sea, in the air, on the land. Uh, and just the idea of having an octopus for a head. I mean, I don't know that anyone else had done that as a concept right. before Lovecraft. And the tentacles, too. I mean, yeah. there's clearly something that draws people to this, uh, both negatively and positively. So, yeah, um, you know, just the tentacles alone. And so adding that in there, I don't know. It, it just... It, I wonder what he would think about the weird cultural phenomenon that Cthulhu. Yeah, I wonder has if you become. showed him like a Cthulhu Funko Pop figure. Like, what's yeah. his? He's gonna be like, what? Or the like fuck? a cutesy wootsy Cthulhu T-shirt, or uh, you know, I vote Cthulhu twenty twenty. Yeah, know. no lives matter. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's just that a lot of people just embrace the story as something that's even somewhat plausible. Because like one that when as I read about him was he had to remind people like Cthulhu is not real. None of this stuff is. I've made all this up. Yeah, <laughs> isn't the idea? Even though they've like you know they've cutified him here in a lot of these cute Thulu. I actually search for cute Cthulhu. Do you so. think that the idea comes from a deep seated desire in humanity, maybe buried under uh, tons of layers of psychology, to be annihilated? Oh yeah, and the idea that like you know this guy is coming to cleanse the world of all the bullshit and all the people you have to deal with. You know, if you got to give up your own life to get there, that's fine. You know, do you think that kind of thinking? I mean, I I think that uh, is I mean, what draws people to him. He's like the herald, right? I don't mean to fucking uh, pimp my own shit, but I actually get into um, this in my the fourth chapter of uh, my book, The Order of Chaos, where I talk about how uh, there is a nihilistic urge towards destruction in humanity right. as, as we become a more nihilistic species. Oh, it's more and more people kind of like you know, gravitate towards this idea of like, oh, wouldn't it be... That's why you see these like giant meteor 2016 and now giant meteor 2020 stickers. It's like, just ended already. Because people People feel like this is such a farce. Because people have comfort in knowing... Like, oh, this will destroy us. This will be the end. Oh, the meteor is going to hit, then we're all fucked. And, and, and it's an it, indiscriminate end. And it's like, how the old, it's like how the older you get, the more you kind of, I'm like, I'm cool with dying one day. Cause, it's, it's, almost a, it's almost a fairer end than we as realists can hope to expect. You right, know what because I mean? we know yeah. our end is actually going to be slow and, uh, you know, acrimonious and, and horrible bitter and and like this would be too but then it would be done and it would be done indiscriminately and the rich and the poor alike would be devoured by the horrible demon until there's none of us left it would, but and then he goes to sleep but again. then there'd also be an answer to all this everything would make sense like okay there's just these elder gods and i'm being yeah. destroyed by them. as crazy and inscrutable as he is he give he scratches that itch for people that that i want to know how this all ends itch he tie he puts a little bow on it for people and i mean think about too like the end of uh uh, uh, cabin in the woods, you know. Right. It wasn't quite Cthulhu that emerges at the end to destroy well, the world. That's like, what it is. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's basically Cthulhu. Horror. It's basically like right. it's they were using God. a Lovecraftian sort of monster, right, to uh, be unleashed on the world. Some and, kind of extra dimensional. Being. And uh, it was presented once again as like a relief. It was an action the main characters chose to engage in because they're like, this is actually better. Well, it's just if this that, is what's supposed to happen. This was supposed to happen. Something interesting about the story too was actually it was initially rejected. Right. Uh, only accepted after another one of his contemporaries and buddies, Donald Wandry, a friend of Lovecraft, falsely claimed that Lovecraft was thinking of submitting it elsewhere. So it's like, well, there's another magazine that's going to print it. So I guess you know weird tales. No, 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 we'll print it. 
which is also why I think it wasn't given prominent billing as well. Because they kind of published it under protest. Kind of, well, kind of just like we don't want to lose it. I mean, like, you know, obviously they have a so they wanted So they wanted to fucking publish it only because they didn't want someone else to publish it yes. and for it to potentially become something. So, obviously, Lovecraft... So it doesn't really seem like, uh, other than, uh, than uh, what's his face, who, who, who lied to Weird Tales? Donald, uh, Wandry. Donald Wandry. Other than Donald Wandry, it doesn't really seem like a lot of people initially believed in this story and its, it's staying power. But the interesting thing is, like, so obviously Lovecraft was very down in the story, but uh, Robert E. Howard, obviously his buddy, uh, wrote this about it. He said, a masterpiece, which I am sure will live on as one of the highest achievements of literature. Mr. Lovecraft holds a unique position in the literary world. He has grabs to all intents. The world's outside our paltry ken. Mm. And uh, this is the guy that you can probably thank for uh, the, the story other than, than Lovecraft. Uh, let's see. Here he is. This is him in... Uh the, probably the 70s or 80s, shortly before his death, Donald Wandry, who was, another, who was another writer of science fiction, fantasy, and weird fiction, so, as well as a poet and an editor. Lovecraft scholar Pete Cannon uh, regarded the story as ambitious and complex, a dense and subtle narrative which horror gradually builds to a cosmic proportions. Cool. So, I mean, a lot of people really... Hi- the, like, the, this is like a totally hype story of his. A lot of people just love this story. He was kind of just like, man, I've done better. You know, this is my worst, this is my best, this is somewhere in the middle. I kind of felt that way after reading it. I didn't really, I mean, it wasn't, I didn't hate it, but I was like, I actually like some of the other Lovecraft shit I've read more than this. Right. But, obviously, uh, something about Cthulhu just resonates like so, nothing else. Kind of a thing we've been talking about, this is a quote from um, uh, Call of Cthulhu. The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all of its con- all its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity. And it was not meant that we should voyage far. <laughs> Sounds like Paul. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. So, TJ, I want you to try to read this. Uh, Sorry. Thing. Did I do a nihilism again? I'm sorry, guys. Sorry. This is the, uh, one of the famous lines in the story, TJ, and I want you to attempt this. Okay. Oh, this? Yes. Okay. Funglu Mglaf Cthulhu Relay. Wagnagi Fatagan. You're close. I know. I actually know the pronunciation. Of yeah, this. We, we actually have a video. Fingli Miglunath Cthulhu Relay Uganaul Fatagan is how I learned it. Mm, all right. Let's see if these people agree. Fingli Miglunath Cthulhu Uganaul Fatagan. Well, I guess we're all wrong. Fingli Miglunath. Sounds pretty fucking cool, though. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty cool. And this means in the house of Relay, dead Cthulhu awaits dreaming. Yeah, yes. dude. Yes, I hope so. Oh, I hope I you like do. It. The nightmare corpse city of Relay, which is a, it's basically a corpse city, uh, was built measureless eons behind history of the by the vast lonesome shapes that have seeped down from the dark stars. There lay great Cthulhu his, and his hordes, hidden in green slimy vaults. Nice. Dreaming in death. Man, I want him to, I want him to come. Until come death on, no longer exists. Come on, Cthulhu. What are you waiting for, man? That it's, is not dead, which can eternal lie. The meat and is, after strange aeons, even death may die. Dude, oh. the meat is not oh. going to taste any Ooh. better oh. as time goes on. We're just going to get more sour. More gamey. We're just more getting gamey. gamier, Cthulhu. Come, Come on, on down. There's still some prime rib down here, Cthulhu. The yeah. last thing we have is the works inspired by Lovecraft. Lovecraftian. Works. Yeah, the Lovecraftian works. Hold on. I want to. Before I do it, I want to. Uh, I want to read a Stephen King quote that I pulled oh, up. Sure, man. Go ahead. Um. I think uh, I'll I'll put this one up, but I'll put the full quote up in a minute. Uh, this is not the full quote I want to read, but that's part of the quote there. <laughs> what? What? It's Stephen King. He I mean, just he, like does, his face he is a goofy me. looking fuck. I admit <laughs> yeah, that. He is. It just uh, every time I see him, it dawns on me that he has created so many of my nightmares, and I'm just like, holy shit! Man. <laughs> He's so goofy. Welcome to Paul's nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, now that time has given us uh, some perspective on his work. Did space create your nightmares, Paul? 
Now that time has given us some perspective on his work, says Stephen King, I think it is beyond doubt that H.P. Lovecraft has yet to be surpassed as the 20th century's greatest practitioner of the classic horror tale. Uh, Around 1960, a young Stephen King came across an old paperback edition of Lovecraft's The Lurking Fear and Other Stories. It was a decisive moment for today's preeminent horror writer. Lovecraft opened the way for me, writes King, as he had done for others before me. It is in his shadow, so long and gaunt, and his eyes, so dark and puritanical, which overlie almost all of the important horror fiction that has come ever since. So that... Uh, from the mouth of today's most iconic horror author is where H.P. Lovecraft falls on the pantheon of I don't horror think, authorship. Yeah, but I don't think Stephen King would... I mean, he's, like, look, I don't think most people are going to come out and say, like, I surpassed H.P. Lovecraft. I surpassed who, like, who came before me. Most, right. most people are going to have some bit of humility in them to realize, even if they believe that, it's probably not the best thing to well, say. Well, but I think what Stephen King is saying there is, like, the genealogy of modern horror, you can't escape Lovecraft's fucking shit. Well, that, yeah, if you look at the next It's thing, not about popular... I mean, like, obviously, is Stephen King more popular than H.P. Lovecraft? in his lifetime, of way course. Way more. Not, I mean, even to this... I well, mean, even to this thing. Even sure. his legacy is larger. Well, I mean, there's way more adaptations of <laughs> his work in the film. He's created probably more <laughs> iconic characters. But that's, um, <clears throat> that's on the back of... yeah. The whole genre of horror, which Stephen King basically said that H.P. Lovecraft created. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, extremely instrumental in the creation of it. He brought. So, a lot I mean, of obviously, it a, obviously, the scary story existed before Howard Phillips Lovecraft ever drew breath, but sure. he, he changed. On that stuff. He changed what it was about. Right. In a way, I mean, and you know, uh, maybe you could even say that Lovecraft uh, was in the shadow of of Poe, but. Um, as far as he these was. guys are concerned, when they look back to the genealogy of like, where did what we do start? H.P. Lovecraft. But you, you build on the past, obviously. Like, right. like, you know, the world you're born into, I mean, what, whether it's 500 years from now or fucking 500 years before, you live in the world and the time you mm-hmm. live in. And obviously, every, uh, ever since we have a human civilization, it's been built upon that. So obviously, Stephen King built his works upon the works of these guys and the guys that he ins- uh, that were inspired by Lovecraft that carried on his legacy. So and his let's works. take a look at some of the. Uh, this is a Wikipedia Wikipedia show. <laughs> Good yeah. meme, you guys. But if you, but if you see why, it, look how much shit there is. I mean, but yeah, we couldn't possibly pull all this. So uh, Lovecraftian horror. This is uh, just uh, stuff inspired by Lovecraft. Obviously, tons of comics, including uh, Alan yeah, Moore, I see, is mentioned here. I didn't necessarily want to go through each one. It was just to show you the breadth. Right. But, I mean, I'm just kind of trying to pick out, like, uh, film and television. Uh, Roger Corman <laughs> was inspired, I guess. Uh, I love, I mean, Roger Corman movies. Uh, though not direct adaptations, the episode of the well-known series The Outer Limits often had Lovecraftian themes, such as human futility and insignificance and the limits of sanity and understanding. Um the Dunwich Horror from the 70s, uh, some episodes of The Night Gallery. Alien, uh, right there. Yep. Uh, Dan O'Bannon and Ridley Scott's 1979 Alien. Boris John, Strong, uh, John Carpenter's Wars. Apocalypse Trilogy, including The Thing, which is another one that's kind of like The Color Out of Space. Uh, Prince of Darkness, uh, In the Mouth of Madness. Uh, Ghostbusters is noticeably reminiscent of Lovecraft style. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, <clears throat> you remember um, uh, Tobin's Spirit Guide? Yeah. That is all, you know, uh, that Egon Kinda references. Kind of like the Necronomicon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. It's like a listing of all kinds of weird, uh, ethereal, other dimensional beasts or whatever the fuck, you know, that he always references. So. Uh, it says here, novelist, screenwriter Barbara, Barbara Hambly has called Marvi- Marvelously Lovecraftian. Uh, uh, from Beyond, I mean, you've seen that, TJ. We saw that in the Aereo Theater. Uh, there was actually an episode of the animated series of Ghostbusters called The Collect Call of Cthulhu, or Cat Thulu. Oh, shit, dude. Yep. Oh, 1991 HBO film cast a deadly spell. Dude, I'm legitimately, when I was a kid, I fucking loved that movie. I haven't seen it uh, probably since my 20s or whatever the fuck, but that's an actually legitimately cool movie. It act- you, you have to know that it probably influenced a lot of stuff that came after it because it depicts a modern society where magic is kind of mundane. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where some people can just do it. I see. You know what I mean? So it's like a Harry Potter-esque kind of... And here's that book. Here's what I was talking about, uh, 1995's Castle Freak, loosely inspired by uh, Lovecraft's story, The Outsider. Yeah. Castle Freak, that's a weird fucking movie. I don't know if you guys I've have never seen f- it. heard of You've it or seen, seen it. that. Nope. It's about um, a... Uh, freak in a castle that Uh-oh. um <laughs> kills people he he fucking um mutilates a prostitute he uh 
He, you know, he doesn't really do a whole lot, but he does mutilate a prostitute <laughs> at one point. Oh. I think he like rips, he like bites her vagina off at some point in the movie. It's pretty crazy. I, I've seen the horrible Dagon movie. Look at oh this. God, the bad. television series Buffy the Vampire Slayer and its 1999 spinoff Angel have essentially a Lovecraftian background setting. Citation, citation needed. needed. Oh, <laughs> it's like on. citation. Get out of here. They don't want the, Lovecraft doesn't want credit for everything. Um, the 2010 film Die Fodderby is based on the Color Out of Space. I think there's probably better ones that are based on it. Uh, the Coon and Friends trilogy of the animated South Park. Cthu- yeah, we all saw the yeah, South yeah. Park episode. And uh, I think uh, now that I think about it, Lovecraft would have approved of The Coon. One of the things... So, um, the Coon. I know, Paul, you've talked about a lot about doing... You know, obviously, we do uh, D&D tabletop. You've talked a lot about playing uh, The Call of Cthulhu. Oh, I'm, yeah. I've already so, started to try and learn it. I haven't purchased like the official manual yet, but I've been learning the uh, system slowly but surely because, yeah, we're definitely doing one of these. Obviously, huh. D&D That's interesting. Itself? It says Gore Verbinski's 2016 film, A Cure for Wellness, has been noted for its Lovecraftian elements. It makes me actually want to see that because I passed it up at the time. Have you seen that, Paul? Which one is it? A Cure for Wellness. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've seen A Cure Did for Wellness. Did it strike you as Lovecraftian? Because not not particularly, but I'll defer to the experts on this they're one. They're the experts, huh? Uh, D&D, of course, too. Uh, Cthulhu and then some of the Cthulhu mythos uh, creatures appear in the game. I'm not sure, sure if Cthulhu himself appears in D&D, but I know some of the creatures and gods. He uh, yeah, there's definitely some heavy, like, old god kind of cosmic horror-inspired uh, monsters in D&D, for sure. Uh, we got some... Uh, A lot uh, of am- video games. Amnesia, yeah. The Dark Descent, uh, Call of Cthulhu. Pathologic, uh, I've played. Ang- uh, Bloodborne, I guess, has some Cthulhu shit in it. Uh, Eternal Darkness is uh, one of my favorite Cthulhu. Oh. That's a heavy one. Eternal Darkness was on the GameCube, and it was like super. That was the one where you could lose your sanity, mm-hmm. and you'd go crazy, <laughs> and the game, it, like it would act like the game froze or some shit. What the fuck, dude? Really? And you'd be like, "No, what the fuck!" In real life, and then it would turn out your character just had too low a sanity and would come out of it. Damn. It was crazy shit. It would like blue screen, the screen would invert. It was a neat little mechanic of like punishing you for I allowing guess they your have character an upcoming sanity one called- to get too low. The uh, the second city is an upcoming Lovecrafting horror game where you play as a private. So, I mean, Lovecraft even to this day, it seems like gaming has really embraced a lot of shit recently. In the last like fifteen twenty years, like Lovecraft's become like really like, these kind of Lovecrafting elements, like especially Cthulhu, has become kind of big in gaming. I mean, which I mean, I guess that makes sense because like around like I think it was maybe two thousand eight that election, people started really uh, that fucking elect Cthulhu shit really started getting big. All and, the more reason why uh, the movies should start fucking exploiting this whole Cthulhu thing. Dude, but. a fucking excellently done call Cthulhu movie could probably be really interesting. Yeah, get someone who actually has some fucking directing talent to make that. As long as they say faithful to the fucking story itself and don't give you some like. Oh no! It actually does just like don't give it a Roland Emmerich treatment is what I'm saying. Where Cthulhu actually does destroy the world, or they have to fight him, and Will Smith beats his ass. Oh or my something. god, dude! If they make a fucking Call of Cthulhu movie with Will Smith in it, I'm gonna shoot myself dude, can in I, the fucking head. Can I pitch you guys? I yeah. Go ahead. If I've been quiet or like a little distant over the last ten minutes, it's because my mind has been fucking on fire with this idea for a Cthulhu movie. All right, do it. Okay, I'm gonna pitch it. Should I, I'm gonna put you solo. You don't have to. No, 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 no. Keep your solo. I want no, you, put I don't on want solo. 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 I, Paul. No, just stay here. Please, don't do this to me. All I can't right, fucking... Right, right, right. I don't like that. <laughs> I, don't want, I don't even want the fucking close-up. <coughs> Looks horrible. Uh-huh. <coughs> you need a spotlight, Paul. Yeah, I want the spotlight, but right. not that close-up. Anyway, here's, here's the pitch. It happens in a world where Cthulhu has come back already. Uh-huh. And has started the work of devouring the world, right? And there are obviously pockets of humanity surviving as they can in little places, but he keeps coming back looking for them. And eventually he gets them, right? We follow one group of such people. I'm thinking about like maybe eight to ten people that have congregated together, that think they're part of a network of small other people, right, around the world that are still surviving as he, you know, walks around the earth eating everything, right? Eating everyone. Mm Mm-hmm. And they slowly come to realize that there's nobody else. He comes back and they're like, well, we'll just write him out like we did last time. He found another pocket of people on the other side of the hill over there. Somebody, he always leaves and goes and finds another bigger pocket of people. But he keeps looking and he keeps looking. And we could make Cthulhu just like this huge, monstrous, you know, Cloverfield level monster that just, you know, descends out of the sky with all its tentacles and searches the city with them. It's like a slasher flick where the slasher is Cthulhu. 
Cool. Because they realize, you know, as he doesn't leave, that they are the last people left on fucking Earth. And we watch each one of them slowly but surely succumb to different types of madness. Uh, give themselves there, there. There can be betrayal in the plot, where like one of them was always a servant of Cthulhu that was there to help him get the last ones of them, and he oh, betrays do them. The twist, yeah. You know what I mean? What well, I have another idea though. I like your idea. That's definitely probably a better adaptation than I would come with, dude. But I want Godzilla versus Cthulhu, dude. Well, we could do it. Do I, we have to I, establish I just want Cthulhu a first. I want to spend maybe the- that's the teaser end of it. The last person is about to be killed by Cthulhu, and then we hear that iconic scream cut to black. <laughs> oh shit, dude! Yeah, <laughs> you know, is that what Godzilla sounds like? And then we have, yeah, then we have a ninety-minute battle. I want someone to take the audio of Paul doing that and sync it to Godzilla roaring, <laughs> dude. <laughs> I want, I want, and all I want the film to be is a ninety-minute battle across every fucking continent on this planet, in which Godzilla ends up butt fucking Cthulhu. Wow. But here's Dude. the thing, but, but you know what? Cthulhu can never be truly be defeated, TJ. So it doesn't matter. Even if Godzilla wins, Cthulhu's going to come back one day. I see. There's no way to fucking stop him. Let the fucking population rise up again, and Cthulhu will return in time. <laughs> All right. Well, that's, uh, that's probably about it, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, that's, Is there anything else? That's really it. Is there anything I mean, else, Scotty? I'll tell you what. Unfortunately, there's a lot of stuff we had to leave on the fucking floor, man, because there's so much you can get into with fucking H.P. Lovecraft. Why, and you, the didn't, why you didn't do it right, Scotty? What's wrong with you? I don't know, TJ. What's wrong with you? I don't know, man. That's why like, you didn't represent? I mean, I tried, Maybe dude. his tortured mind couldn't handle I couldn't the even... Cons- Look, dude, when I went into this episode, TJ, I was a normal guy. Now I'm fucking addicted to morphine. Cool. I'm a fucking drunk in a sanitarium. I don't even know. Am I even really here? Well, it sounds like this episode thing. even real. I don't even know what's going on. Ah, no, no. Ah. I don't even know, man. I'm scared. <laughs> this guy just runs out. I guess that's how it ends. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Think he's all right. I hope so. We'll see you on uh, Wednesday, I guess. Yeah. Bye. Peace.